Good evening, and welcome to Chrononauts, a science fiction literature history podcast. I'm Nate, and I'm joined by my co-host, JM. How are you doing tonight? Hello, mechanical electric creatures. <laughs> I'm doing very well, thanks. Excellent. So, yes, tonight we're going to get mechanized by talking about automata. Unlike the last episode, time travel, which is still a purely theoretical mathematical concept, I think that automata are somewhat unique with regards to science fiction themes and that real-world automata have been present with humanity since antiquity. There are plenty of written records from ancient Greece, Rome, China, and India that describe both real and fantastical automata. And sometimes when we deal with ancient history, it can be difficult to sort fantasy from fact, but it's quite clear that hydraulics and pneumatics were known to the ancients. The automated toys, clockwork, and other curiosities are far more plausible than fully autonomous people. Even some of the more fantastic claims show that people were thinking in this direction thousands of years ago. We can see the use of automated devices carry through medieval times, namely in the Byzantine, Arabic, Chinese, and Indian text. And with the European Renaissance comes an increased precision in metallurgy and clockwork. And some of these elaborate automated clocks from this era, like the astronomical clock in Prague, still survive to this day. As far as literature goes, much of the ancient and medieval works which feature automata usually have the beings powered by some sort of magic divine or otherwise. We briefly touch upon a few of these instances in episode one during our discussion of Arabian Nights. From what I can tell, one of the earliest fictional stories that resembles what we would consider a modern mechanized humanoid is from Charles Sorrell's 1632 Gazettes and News from Various Faraway Countries, which is described in Adam Roberts's History of Science Fiction as, quote, having metallic and artificially constructed woman who possesses the knowledge of all the world's languages. Though, unfortunately, from what I can tell, this work has yet to be translated in English from the French, so we're unable to cover it in this episode, but it would be a clear reference point for future study in this area. Instead, tonight we'll be covering five works from the 1800s, three short stories, a novella, and a novel. The first of these is E.T.A. Hoffman's short story, Automata, written in 1814. We covered another one of Hoffman's stories, A Sandman, in episode four, which explores similar themes of humanoid automatons. We go into greater biographical detail of Hoffman in that episode, so we won't repeat too much of it here, but we'll just say that Hoffman himself is typically not seen as a science fiction author, but rather as a major figure in the German Romantic movement, and his best-known work is The Nutcracker and the Mouse King, mostly known through the famous Tchaikovsky Ballet. The story Automata itself is a story in two parts that were initially published in the German literary publication Newspaper for the Elegant World in 1814. Parts of the story were inspired by real-world events, in 1769, Hungarian inventor Johann Wolfgang Ritter von Keppelen de Pazmond constructed and presented Empress Maria Theresa a device called the Turk, a chess-playing automaton garbed in contemporary Turkish dress. The machine was built as an automaton which could play chess, but was a fraud in which a human could hide inside a machine, and several chess masters were the operators, giving the supposed automaton an extremely high level of skill in the game. The machine was destroyed in fire in 1854, but not before it was exposed as a fraud in, among other places, in the 1836 Edgar Allan Poe essay, Maisel's Chess Player, written after the machine was brought to the United States in 1825 by Johann Nepomuk Maisel. Hoffman's story brings in a talking Turk in the second part. The first part is largely unrelated, and the story begins with a narrator walking in on a party of people, silent and transfixed by their attempts to move a ring by pure will which has been suspended from the ceiling. One of the party guests, Cyprian, begins telling a ghost story where a young French girl named Adelgunda imitates the urban legend of the White Lady, where she sees a ghostly figure, but nobody else in her family does, and she's paralyzed by fear. She regularly sees the apparition at 9 o'clock, and her family think it's all in her head, changes the clocks back an hour without telling her. Instead of this plan working, Adelgunda sees the apparition when her modified clock strikes 8. And during this incident, a plate hovers around the room, her sister Augusta and her mother fall into fevers, which kill the mother and leave Augusta mute, who thinks she's Adelgunda's phantom. And then the first part of the story ends, the guests briefly discuss some elements of the story, and then another guest, Theodore, begins reading his story, which is the automata. So the second part begins with a talking Turk being exhibited, which is roughly the size of a human being and clothed in exquisite Turkish dress. His face and figures are completely lifelike, and people would whisper a question in its right ear, and it would turn its head and answer. Occasionally, its exhibitor would unscrew its left ear to reveal gear work and the underlying mechanisms. Some people don't believe in its an automata, but rather a ventriloquism trick, but the Turk gives strangely prophetic answers to the questions it's asked. 
Two local men, Lewis and Ferdinand, discuss the situation and find imitations of humans like in wax museums incredibly disagreeable. The two of them go to investigate whether the Turk is real or just a parlor trick. Ferdinand asks the Turk a question, and at the answer he turns pale. He asks a follow-up and is satisfied with the answer that he received and relates to Lewis that the Turk has a sensory intelligence and relates his backstory and the nature of the question he asked. On his return from East Prussia, he hears a captivatingly gorgeous melody being sung by a beautiful woman, one that he had always had visions and impressions of since a child as an ideal figure. Upon his departure, he sees the woman getting into a carriage and believes he'll never see her again. The initial question he posed to the Turk is if he will ever find love again, and the Turk responds saying that it's distracted by the gold glittering at its breast, where he has placed a picture of the mysterious woman. He moves it aside and repeats his question, and the Turk says the next time he sees her, he will be lost to her forever. And that's pretty much the meat of the story right there. Yeah. There's this Professor X character, but right. <clears throat> and he's another kind of disagreeable, like he's another one of Hoffman's sort of off-putting weird characters. Yeah, this Professor X has invented a great deal of music automats, and he's sought out by both Lewis and Ferdinand. And while Lewis feels that the talking portion of the talking Turk is an acoustical deception, he's concerned with the nature of his answers and how it can apparently see into the nature of one's soul. So Professor X is gladly showing off his musical automata and they have a very in-depth discussion of the nature of music. Yeah, it sort of comes out of nowhere like yeah. a lot of his story does. Yeah, exactly. That, that doesn't really seem to connect. This is an interesting almost series of vignettes without much connective tissue to it. Right. So everything is kind of interesting in its own right. And at the end, he sort of comes up with this like deliberately half-baked almost... I'm pulling your leg kind of explanation as to how all this goes together. <laughs> yeah. The musical bit is how I came across a story in the first place, because I was familiar with the Balzac story Gambara, which we also covered in episode four. And I was looking for other things along those lines to talk about yeah. novel and we sounds. Done, we and we could have done this one at that time as well. Right. We kind of decided, well, since it seems directly to involve automata, right. uh, why don't we do it in this one? Yeah. Uh, but it goes into great detail about an ideal form of sound. And they both agree that the music played by the automata is a bit lifeless. It doesn't have the human feeling behind it. But they talk about a harmonic chord, which at the time was a novel 19th century instrument, which attempted to fuse the sounds of a piano and violin together. So while they're having this conversation, they hear a melody being sung, the haunting melody that Ferdinand heard sung by the mysterious woman. This little girl tells them both that her sister is singing, and they look out to see Professor X coordinating some kind of natural symphony, and Ferdinand says there is some evil working at his existence. They intend to follow up on this further, but Ferdinand unexpectedly is summoned by his father back home. He writes to Lewis two months later, says he's witnessed a wedding, which is between Professor X and a mystery woman, that fulfills the Turk's initial prophecy of him being lost to the mysterious woman forever. And Lewis is conflicted and confused, and then the story then cuts back to the party guests who are not satisfied, some of them, by the ambiguous ending. And Theodore clarifies that it was only a fragment and speaks in favor of fragments by stating that sometimes novels go in the way of too much detail, killing any sense of mystery. But on the other hand, a fragment of a clever story can sink deep into your soul and yeah. continuous of the play of the imagination. So I agree with Hoffman, but on the other hand, he's also saying, well, if you feel that this particular story that I've just written you in the newspaper is disjointed, <laughs> yeah, deal right. with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And it is a little disjointed. The two parts of the story, the ghost story and the talking Turk, literally have nothing to do with one another. They're just kind of bound together with the same framing device, which doesn't really need to be there at all either, really. No. I mean, you could almost make this into one of those, like, this whole thing could almost be a night gallery episode or something. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah. how they, they usually start with a painting, right? And then they have three not really connected stories. Yep. Maybe one longer one and a couple of shorter ones. Like that's, it's it's a different format for an anthology show. And I always kind of liked it because a lot of it does seem like fragmentary. as like pieces of a picture or whatever. This story kind of has that same format. In a similar fashion, Sandman has a different framing device where it starts off with the letters and then go and it goes into a more straightforward yeah. narrative. But it's still all connected to yeah. Nathaniel's predicament. Right. Really. Yeah. But here, I don't think it works quite as well as Sandman, even though some of the same themes are present. 
of human automata and it has the same kind of discussion of an uncanny valley like concept right, exactly it doesn't have the psychological ramifications that sandman does but it does bring up that basic concept and they're talking about well, what makes real they tie it into the discussion of music yeah and it's something that we hear up to the present day where people say oh these are not real instruments they're synthesized and and it's a machine not a real person right right and you still get that today and there are times in certain kinds of music where even i might be inclined to feel this way i mean sure yeah i think a lot of overproduced rock music especially can sound like it sucks all the energy out of the recording it just yeah. sounds like you're pressing random buttons on the rock music machine and you know <laughs> out comes the output yeah especially now with a lot of the really mainstream like heavy metal albums they all have the same snare drum sound mm -hmm. i feel like it's the andy sneep snare sound <laughs> it's the identical snare sound that judas priest and accept and all these other bands use now right and i was i just heard another album with it the other day i can't remember what it was but I, but it's the same thing and it does take you out of the experience if what you want to actually experience is a live feeling of musicians playing in front of you on the other hand now in 2020 i think most people have come to accept that electronic music can be its own special thing and even though I think Nate and I, we probably both agree that instruments that sound like nothing but some kind of synthesized sound are really cool, you can also get pretty cool, good-sounding horns and strings and pianos and stuff that sound pretty natural. Yeah, and absolutely. Most people can't really tell the difference, and yeah. it's, it's something that's gotten better and better over time. So it's just interesting to me that in 1814, these concepts were already in theory around mm -hmm. and they talk a lot about the new instruments coming out all the time yeah and that's a theme that we might not talk about too much in the podcast no. but through the 19th century there's these strange musical instruments developed that never really went anywhere especially after the invention of the telephone yeah because when alexander graham bell patented the invention people like elijah gray who were working on the problem and very close to it, they couldn't make any money off of it. So they had to apply their knowledge and research elsewhere. So Elisha Gray in particular developed several strange instruments using aborted telephone technology. Yeah, I'd like to learn more about that, actually. I understood that he was actually so close to coming up with the telephone before Bell that it was literally almost just a matter of who got to the patent office. That's exactly what it was. Bell beat him to the patent office by one hour. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if Bell had stumbled and sprained his ankle yeah, that day, it would have been be... Elisha Gray who had the telephone and the enormous empire that came with it. Yeah. So who knows what would be different then? At least we'd be paying our bills to the <laughs> yeah, Gray <right>. company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, who knows? But yeah, I mean, I'd like to, I'd definitely like to learn about that. But 1814 definitely predates all those things. Oh, Absolutely. And these were purely mechanical instruments. Yeah. I don't think electricity is mentioned in the story at all no. that I remember. No. I don't even think Sandman, the android, was electrical. I think no. that might have also been purely mechanical. Yeah, it was a, all mechanical. I'm just trying to remember whether electricity was mentioned at all, but I don't think so. Yeah. I don't think it was mentioned. And that's... I mean, it was already a thing, but even Frankenstein doesn't really, like, go into it. So. No, electricity is mentioned offhand Frankenstein. Right. And yeah. by 1814, not too much was known about electricity. I mean, it was known that it was a natural phenomenon, but a lot of the mathematical theory behind it hadn't been sketched out yet. There were almost no practical inventions that used it. It was still very much a curiosity. The opening of the story with the pendulum and stuff and the way it's set up in the horror, the horror, yeah. little horror story about the girl seeing the apparition, like, again, it, it had this feeling of one of those teen horror movies almost where you, you have <laughs> right. people getting bored at a party and they're like, let's hold a seance because that's so much more interesting than right. the party we're having. Right. And then they do. And there's some weird Ouija board thing or something like that. And it, that's still a thing now which is so odd to think about, but it's, it's, it's it, uh, those movies are still being made and books still being written. There was one I came across recently by that Richard Lehman guy. I guess it's not that new, but it's just the same kind of, oh, you know, let's hold a seance and all this weird stuff starts to happen. And 
it was good and creepy, which seems to be, like we said, Hoffman's not really known for science fiction. Right. But a lot of his stories have this creepy, uncanny feeling to them. Yeah, uh, and I think the ghost story actually works better than the Automata segment in this. The Automata segment does raise some interesting ideas, but overall, I don't think it's quite as effective, where the ghost story is pretty short, and it is pretty creepy. Yeah. I think the reason, again, it's the psychological angle, right? That, that right. appeals to us more. The automaton segment has the, oh, wow, they're thinking of this uncanny difference between the artificial and the godborn or whatever humanity. Right. And, and it's so, it seems ahead of its time, but it's gone into a lot more in Sandman. So I think we both sort of had a greater appreciation of the depth that that one took. And yeah, you even sure. said after having read Automata before that Sandman surprised you a lot. Yeah. Because I thought Automaton, when I first read it, was just okay. I mean, I didn't dislike it, but it kind of left me flat. And especially when I was reading it compared to Balzac, I mean, it's just no comparison who's had the better yeah. story between the two. But yeah, I was really, really blown away by Sandman. And I, I guess I just didn't expect that, considering it was written roughly around the same time as Automaton was written, at least a couple years prior. Yeah, I think we both said after reading Sandman that we would like to read more often. I don't know if we will for this podcast but i don't think so but yeah, i think probably. most of his work is short enough where it wouldn't take too much time to read it i think the golden flower pot is what people say is his best one though the nutcracker seems to be the most well known as i said due to the ballet which is still incredibly popular to this day it's very popular it plays here i think every year still uh, although it probably won't this year yeah we saw it two or three years ago i want to say at the local theater and it was a pretty good production. In his lecture on Hoffman, Eric Rapkin mentions a couple other stories that sound interesting, too. There's a doppel, which is a kind of a doppelganger type right. story. Right. And there's also a weird one about a girl that has some kind of epileptic condition or whatever that makes her it, it, hearing beautiful music is a life-threatening experience to her. Yeah. Like, she can't. And so she falls in love with this guy and... I think he happens to be a piano player or something like that. So that's pretty dangerous, right? <laughs> I don't know. She probably dies in the end. I don't know. Because that would be the way that kind of thing goes. Right. Uh, he seems to have just been really interested in this the uh, ideas of music maybe especially being such a powerful thing that it can move somebody so sublimely. Like, it's kind of ridiculous in Automata where uh, he doesn't even... He just hears a fragment of this piece of music on the piano, and he's so overtaken, right? And it seems almost excessive, but at the same time, it's it's obviously this beautiful aesthetic effect, right? Yeah. And he describes it pretty well, of, of this idea of a person's soul being shaken almost, and, and they become obsessed with this thing for the rest of their life. Yeah, it's. I think around that time is when music started to be consumed more as a theatrical performance rather than something that held sense. inside a church or yeah. something like that. Uh, well, I, I guess operas were the big spectacle at the time. And, yeah. and Hoffman himself yeah. dabbled in, in writing um, music. He right. kind of apparently realized at some point that he'd never be a brilliant musician and devoted most of his life to, to writing prose instead, but... He was, it was obviously something that really interested in him. Yeah, yeah no, I don't definitely. really have anything else to say about Automata. It's, it's good, but Sandman was a better story. Yeah, though I didn't dislike this one. It still left me a little flat like it did the first time I read it. But the ghost story is kind of cool, and it does bring up some interesting ideas, and it's really not that long. So, so read it. Next, we're going to be talking about the Steam Man of the Prairies, or the Huge Hunter, which has the honor of often being considered the first Edisonade, and it seems to me like it might also be the first story involving some kind of mecha technology. These claims, of course, are incredibly difficult to quantify, so for now, we'll just say that it's a very early example of all these things. Its author, Edward S. Ellis, was born in 1840 and died in 1916, and wrote over 150 novels most of which were written under a wide variety of pseudonyms, so it's difficult to say exactly how much work he's written. 
For biographical information here, we're consulting the excellent Northern Illinois University Libraries House of Beetle Adams and its Dime and Nickels Novels Project, possibly the most comprehensive source of information online about this period and genre of American literature. Ellis's early published work was poetry in 1857 issues of Gleason's Pictorial. His first published novel was Dick Flinton, or Life on the Border, which was serialized in New York Dispatch in 1859. Seth Jones, or The Captives of the Frontier, was published in 1860 and allegedly sold half a million copies, and the success of this work has encouraged him to continue writing for the rest of his career. Seth Jones has the honor of being number eight in Beatles' dime novel series, published by Irwin P. Beatle and Company of 141 William Street. The first in the series is Miss Anne S. Stevens, Malaska, the Indian Wife of the White Hunter, published on June 9, 1860, and many of these novels were shorter romance or adventure novels. Ellis had around 20 entries in this series alone. Steam Man was published in August of 1868, number 45 in the American Novels imprint series. Like the Hoffman, it seems to have been inspired by real-life demonstrations. Earlier in 1868, inventor Zadok Dedrick demonstrated what he called the Newark Steam Man on Broadway in New York City in early 1868 and obtained a patent, number 75874, for it on March 24, 1868. Two newspapers ran stories on the demonstration. The January 23rd issue of the Newark Advertiser stated that, quote, the Newark machinist has invented a man, one that, moved by steam, will perform some of the most important functions of humanity, that will, standing upright, walk or run as he is bid, in any direction, and at almost any rate of speed, drawing after him a load whose weight would tax the strength of three draft horses. A physical description was provided, saying, quote, The man stands seven feet and nine inches high, the other dimensions of the body being correctly proportioned, making him a second Daniel Lambert by which name he is facetiously spoken of among the workmen. He weighs 500 pounds. Steam is generated in the body or trunk, which is nothing but a three-horsepower engine, like those used in our steam fire engines. However, the New York Express states in their March 21st issue, quote, It was the original intention of Mr. Dederick to have exhibited the steam man today in full running motion, but this he says he would not be permitted by the insurance company. He says that he could easily accomplish a mile in two minutes on a level course and offers to test this on a Long Island course as soon as the weather gets fine. This engine is a four horsepower and the man takes 30 inches in each stride. Perhaps the most extraordinary attribute of the animal is the faculty of stepping over all obstructions not higher than a foot. Of course, all these assertions are the inventors and not the result of the reporter's investigations. A photograph exists of the demonstrated model, and the patent drawing has the figure smoking a pipe as a steam release valve. So, whether Dederick was a con man or an over-enthusiastic inventor, it doesn't appear that this fully functional steam man was ever produced or introduced into actual any labor situation, for reasons that should be fairly obvious in light of concepts of modern robotics locomotion. But it was a bit of a pop culture phenomenon. Steam Man of the Prairies and Ports this idea of a steam-powered humanoid figure able to move around on two legs into the Western adventure dime novel genre. And the novel was quite popular, inspired a great deal of knockoffs, and it was reprinted six times, the latest being in 1904. The Steam Man is introduced right away, with Yankee Ethan Hopkins and Irishman Mickey McSquizzle observing a huge man running around the plains with smoke pouring out of it. It should be said right up front that this novel relies heavily on ethnic stereotypes throughout, especially with regards to Native Americans who are constantly referred to as a slur that somehow lent its name to an American football team as late as 2020. Piloting the steam man is Baldy Bickel, who got this nickname because he had previously been scalped, and similar to Dederick's steam man, the device Baldy is piloting is 10 feet high. It has a knapsack containing water and a cavity in its chest for burning fuel. The machine was built by Johnny Brainerd, a boy genius who suffers from kyphosis. His father was killed in a boiler explosion, and he is passionate about inventing, always envisioning this type of steam man. While the term Edison Aid was applied retroactively to these type of adventure stories that feature a boy genius inventor, Edison himself was not a household name in 1868, even though this is one of the earliest examples of the archetype. I was wondering when you were going to get around to actually saying what an Edison ad was. Yeah, it's a term that was applied, I think, in the 1970s or 1980s in one of these science fiction encyclopedias 
that are used to describe the whole glut of stories that are basically a knockoff of this novel that were very popular in pulp magazines in the 1890s and early 1900s. And there are dozens of these series. We're going to be talking about Tom Edison Jr. and Electric Bob as two examples of them in a future Edison 8 episode. But most of them are quite derivative of the themes here. They either feature a Western scenario or some kind of seafaring scenario where the boy genius invents a mechanical vehicle that is able to kill lots of people. <laughs> There's also Edison's Conquest of Mars. Right, which is a bit different in that it's not a boy genius, but it's actually Thomas Edison himself. It's actually himself. Thomas Edison himself. Yeah. yeah. But it's pretty much exactly what you described, except going into space. Right. And there is another one that I think that involves Tom Jr., where it kind of also goes into space, but it turns out that this guy thinks he's on Mars, but he's not. can't remember the name of that one, but that's I was reading... That's To Mars with Tesla. Right. So... Okay, that's a Tesla one. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that still could count as an Edison odd, in, like, technically. Right, because Tom so, Jr. is Tesla's assistant in that right, story. Exactly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. But we'll be talking more about those stories in the future Edison 8 episode we do. But we decided to put Steam Man with this episode because it really doesn't... Well, I guess it does fit with those stories in that it serves as the model for them. But it's a couple decades prior to them being written and... Like I said, Edison was not a household name in 1868. No, but we'll be revisiting him very soon. Oh, absolutely. He, yeah. He'll be a very large figure As in throughout today. the latter half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why don't you very briefly then take us through what happens in this little dime novel? Sure. So in constructing the steam man, Brainerd had some initial difficulty with the locomotion aspect, but he eventually gets it to run 60 miles per hour on a railroad. We get some more backstory on how he meets Baldy who then meets up with Ethan and Mickey returning east after a failed gold prospecting mission. On their ship, the boiler explodes and they save Baldy from drowning. Natives arrive and massacre most of the survivors, leaving the three men barely escaping. They get back to St. Louis. Baldy tells them that he has found gold in Wolf Ravine and intends to go back and get it. At Wolf Ravine, they're pinned down by a native attack. They're barely able to drive them off, but Baldy manages to escape and gets back to St. Louis to retrieve the steam man for the defense. The size of the huge man and the whistle initially works on securing their safety, but apparently Brainerd forgot to put a lantern on the front, so the steam man can't reverse, so it's not totally invulnerable, and it's prone to these odd accidents here and there. The novel then jumps to where we were at the present with the backstory being done. Mining continues largely without incident, and Brainerd goes to hunt some buffalo. Unfortunately, he didn't bring a big enough gun to kill them, so he only succeeds in making them angry. One of the yeah, buffaloes. I love that part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the buffaloes charges into the steam man and he nearly gets capsized, but when he gets a safety, he sees that it's only a dent in the armor. He encounters a grizzly bear and also has the same problem with the gun not being big enough to do anything but make the bear mad, so his only option is to flee to the top of a tree where he makes a rope out of his coat to retrieve the gun they just dropped, and when he gets it, he shoots the bear in the face a couple times and kills it. He's surprised by a native tracker who he then shoots and he gets the steam man and out of danger, but he realizes that the steam man is low on water and again he regrets he didn't install a pump in it because it takes a few hours for it to fill. The camp is deserted and when Brainerd is looking for his friends, he encounters this huge hunter trapper named Duff McIntosh who says he knows Baldy, but doesn't believe Brainerd when he explains to him about the steam man and its powers. Brainerd gets a steam man started and runs away from him, and eventually finds Baldy, who is apprehensive about Macintosh, and says they'd quarreled previously. Here it looks like the book is going to set Macintosh up as a main antagonist of the story, but instead it pivots to a native attack scene, which they're able to dispel. And after deciding to move east with the gold, two weeks pass with nothing happening, and completely the book just drops the huge hunter plot, and we never see Macintosh again. So on the way back east, a storm approaches. The steam man is not designed to run in the rain. Baldy proposes to take back roads to the Missouri River to decrease their chances of being attacked or robbed, disassemble the steam man there, and get on a steamship to St. Louis. The steam man had sprung a leak in its water tank and almost explodes. They have to drag it up a hill as it can't walk the distance. That night, they're stalked by several dozen natives who are looking for a way to capture the steam man, but Brainerd sets a fire in the steam man's boiler, superheating it, and sets it to run towards the native camp at 40 miles per hour, exploding in a huge mess of fire and metal. In the confusion, they're able to take the natives' horses, 
get back to St. Louis with Golden Hand. They split it evenly. Brainerd intends to rebuild the Steam Men, but this time better. And that's where the novel leaves us off. Yeah. And that's it. So, yep. yeah, it, it's a pretty simple story. It's not really about anything. Like, I mean, it's, yeah, this boy invents a Steam Man, but obviously the Steam Man is really just a locomotive on legs, which is how it's described. Yeah, pretty much. In the book. And yeah. he drives it. So, I mean, technically speaking, it isn't any kind of automaton because it doesn't run by itself. Yeah. But it's obviously in the shape that resembles a human being wearing a hat. <laughs> right. And it does have uh, to have some kind of hydraulic system due to right. the fact that it is steam powered and it does need the movements to get the legs up and down and the arms back and forth, which is more or less the same as how modern robotics function, even though it's not described in any level of detail that would resemble how robots are constructed today. Mm -hmm. No, this story does not actually go into much detail about the construction at all. No, it actually mentions that it says it is going to later in the novel, but I don't think it ever does. No, no, actually, it doesn't. <laughs> and a lot of things actually don't seem to get picked up. You mentioned the hunter earlier, but it actually occurred to me that perhaps he figures as a character in some of Ellis's other books. That's possible. I don't know this for sure, but one of the references that I saw to this book, and granted this was passing online and sometimes with things that are this old and obscure you can't quite be sure whether uh, something is a true reference or not but it did seem to suggest that this was like the fourth book in a as some kind of sequence yeah so it could be that the huge hunter is actually featured elsewhere right but there was really no reason to include him if you didn't know that he was elsewhere Maybe it was like a nice fan name drop for the people who enjoyed his yeah. previous work. But other than that, and it is weird because he is set up to be this threatening antagonist. And he's like right away being very unpleasant with the boy. And everybody speaks in a funny dialect. So he's like, uh, now you don't be using any of your big words with me there. And <laughs> the boy is being very meek and, and kind of fearful of this guy and, and he manages to get away from him and yeah you never hear from him again and it's said that he and Baldy knew each other which is mentioned authorially but not in conversation and right. it never comes up so it's yeah. like <laughs> this very obvious conflict situation is set up that doesn't happen yeah and that's kind of disappointing the huge hunter himself was introduced about halfway through the story too and then he just kind of goes away right before the end it, it's very yeah. strange i don't know if it was initially serialized i don't think it was though because these dime novels are pretty short and and singularly published yeah right again i did get the feeling that maybe that character might feature else it's certainly very possible i mean in the dime novel series that was published by beetle ellis had this was number 40 so this was number 40 Five in the American novel series, the Beetle Dime novel series, he had 20 entries in that. And yeah. he's had to have dozens of entries in other series elsewhere. So who knows, really? I don't know yeah. how available a lot of these are online. Steam Man is fairly popular amongst his catalog in that it is one of the earliest science fiction ones that he does, or at least could be considered science fiction due to the boy inventor aspect and building this steam man whereas the others i think are just straightforward western adventure stories yeah sounds like it but i think the way, reason why this one gets attention is because it does have those science fiction ties but a lot of the other ones i don't think have been digitized or posted online or would even be available from modern reprints I think the goal back then was just to churn out as much stuff as possible that's going to sell quickly, and then you move on to the next thing without right. regard much for quality or consistency or anything like that. And Ellis doesn't seem to really, I mean, he may have been capable of doing things like going deep into the mindsets of the people in the book, but he doesn't really do it at all. Like, there's not any kind of introspection really at no. all in no. the story. Yeah, everybody's completely one dimensional. And the story is the good guys get the gold and kill the bad guys. Yeah. And that's and it. And Indians are treacherous. Right. So right. they're described as redskins a few times, but it's weird because the most common adjective that I think he uses prior to redskins or Indians or something like that is treacherous. Right. And I'm just kind of thinking like, what? What did 
what did they do? <laughs> yeah, no, they're completely <laughs> dehumanized and not sad. presented as people, but rather an attacking force in the same way that he deal with a buffalo or a grizzly bear or yeah, something like that. Yeah, but saying they're treacherous implies that they somehow they were the ones that broke the treaties or something. I don't right, know. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like the the grizzly bear wasn't being treacherous. The grizzly bear was just being a grizzly bear. Yeah, and I guess right? in that sense, the grizzly bear and the buffalo were dealt with more fairness than the natives were. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, we were both discussing this, and I was expecting the violence to be more violent. Like, it's tamer than I was expecting. Right. I just couldn't help but imagine if somebody like Robert E. Howard had written this, and granted that was like several decades later, but he would have had people really being scalped, and people would get shot in the gut and die really nastily and stuff. Yeah. And in this story, people get shot and they shriek and fall over, pretty much. And that's right. A couple like people get scene. scared and knock off of a cliff, and even in the final explosion where the steam man blows up and presumably kills dozens of people, it's not really described in any graphic detail. No, and the shooting of a bear. I mean, there was a little bit of tension in that part, but even that, it's described in such a detached way like i don't know in retrospect you would want it to be a bit more something you have right. a bit more to it to make you feel something visceral mm -hmm. uh, so it's lacking both the psychological and the visceral side of what makes a story good i think right right and you know i think that that definitely some of the pulp authors like robert e howard did manage a little bit of both but especially to capitalize on how visceral violence could be and how it is like this bolt of testosterone going through you almost, mm -hmm. or at the very least adrenaline, right? And you just, you feel something from it. Whereas this is just kind of, okay, so he took his gun and he shot this person <laughs> and he yelled and fell over and now let's move on, right? Like, just no, and this boy too, like, he's just murdering people left and right, right? Yeah. And he doesn't feel anything, <laughs> like, and, and it's so weird because in the beginning, you know, it's talking about him and his mother and... The mother doesn't get mentioned again, like, after the first quarter of the story. Mm -hmm. Like, even when he goes back at the end, she doesn't even come up. Yeah. I don't know, man. She lets him get away with a lot, that's for sure. He, like, put the cat in a balloon and lost her cat, and she's just <laughs> kind of smiling and going, You go, boy, invent something new. <laughs> and right. I mean, he has to be 13 or 14 or something like that when the story's yeah, yeah. taking place, and she lets him go west with a strange man. With, yeah, basically a stranger. Like... <laughs> I know people might have been more trusting then, but like, not, I don't know, the, not in the Wild West. Yeah, right. Right. Like, it's kind of, and the kind of the idea is that, yeah, there's no father. So, like, the mother and her son probably kind of need each other, mm -hmm. right? So, she would be a little more concerned, maybe. But she's like, not even a character. But oddly enough, she is actually the one that suggests the idea of the steam mad to him. Right. And he sits there and thinks for a minute and goes, by Jove, I can do this. <laughs> and so he and does. Because he yeah. he's a boy genius, yeah. right? We're talking about this, and the boy genius is certainly a very common trope now, or even the girl genius, but we don't really know where that started. No, I tried it's... to find an example, a real-life example, and I couldn't find really anything that would have come before this. Certainly Edison was not a household name at the time. He was starting to do some of his early work, but... Even then, he wasn't a teenager. He, was he wasn't that his, young. He was in his early 20s, mid-20s. Yeah. yeah, it's odd, though. I mean, it's interesting, I guess, reading what adventure-hungry, probably mostly boys, would have been yeah. interested in reading in 1868, right. right? I mean, obviously, if you were born around that area and you were reading that, like you could probably easily imagine yourself doing all those things. Yeah. And in that sense, in a way, if authors want to encourage or if Beatle publications or whatever wants to encourage kids to start thinking about building things or maybe learning survival skills or going out into the wild, they actually don't want to have too much character background or backstory or psychological insight. They want to actually sort of have a tabula rasa so that kids can easily imagine themselves in the shoes of the characters that are in the situation almost. Yeah, absolutely. And when I was looking at the dime novel series that was published by Beetle on the Northern Illinois University Libraries website. They have summaries of all the novels in the series, and they more or less alternate between the Western romance novels, presumably intended at young girls, and the Western adventure novels, presumably intended at young boys. But almost all of them had a Western-type theme, which is interesting because 
this was around the time where I guess modern or westerns from the classic era of the 40s and 50s are normally set. So seeing something written contemporaneously to the genre, which normally feels like a historical romance in a sense, is kind of interesting. Yeah, it's definitely a time capsule, if nothing else. Yeah. I'm sorry that phrase was kind of cheesy, but <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's still, it's, it is a figment of its time that yeah. you kind of would mostly read out of curiosity, I think, for what a juvenile adventure would have been like at that time. Right. Uh, it doesn't really have a lot of valuable content aside from that. No. Got to be a little hard on it now for various reasons, I think. Yeah, it's quite racist. Um, and that's pretty yeah. obvious from the get-go. Pretty much all the characters are ethnic stereotypes. You know, the Irish man talks in ridiculous Irish oh. vernacular. Oh, that's, that's and, so funny. And his wife, she has an unpronounceable <laughs> Irish name. name. I don't know how the yeah, narrator I... took a... Uh, go at that on a LibriVox. <laughs> I listened to the LibriVox recording of this, and, and it was read by this uh, older-sounding fellow. And in a way, it was a, quite appropriate, because, I mean, I don't want to put down anybody, but he almost sounded like he could have been alive back then. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he was obviously a much older fellow, and he did all the accents, which was quite something, but I, I can't remember what he said for this crazy, crazy name. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah yeah there's not really much to the story it's just a basic adventure story where the good guys get the gold they encounter no real obstacles and there were some nice descriptions of the landscape and then like especially the atmosphere at nighttime yeah that i thought were well done i would have liked to see more of that but all that would have done would have been to make the story longer probably so mm -hmm. it's okay that he didn't put i mean but but the man clearly knew this kind of landscape and could probably write in more depth if he wanted to. Yeah. So it would be, I mean, probably beyond the scope of this podcast, but it would be interesting to see if he has any outliers in his bibliography, I guess, that are a little bit different, maybe. Well, certainly his previous works were extremely popular. Hmm. The Seth Jones sold half a million copies, which in the American publishing market in 1860 yeah, that's a lot. seems yeah. like a lot. Yeah, That is a hell of a lot. Especially for back then. Right. Yeah. But I think a lot of them were these Western adventures. So he's probably, I don't know if he's going through the motions at this time, but certainly experienced that writing Western scenes. Yeah, well, I mean, that definitely happens to authors when they get comfortable with something. Right. Sometimes, anyway, when art, maybe not their primary consideration, just churn out what they know is going to sell. Yeah, Unfortunately, exactly. that's, a, that's a thing that happens. And, and you could possibly argue that some people don't exploit their full talents because they know they can make money. The guy that wrote The King in Yellow, Robert Chambers, he wrote The King in Yellow. I think those stories were written while he was like kind of poor and didn't have much to eat. And he was living in a garret in Paris. But somewhere along the line, he got famous and he lived in a big mansion somewhere in New York State. And by 1920s, he was like churns and churning out lots of cheesy romances and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And just because he knew where the money was, I guess. And he didn't want to go back to that shitty attic apartment or whatever, right? Right. So just that just happens over time. But we don't know. Although Ellis did write poetry, so I don't know. I think once he got into the dime novel circuit, that's where he stayed for his entire career. Yeah, yeah. It sounds and like it. there um, were, I don't know how many dime novel authors who were as prolific as him, but it seems like a lot. I mean, all these dime novel series have literally hundreds of entries in them. I think the original Beatle dime novel series has something like 310, 320 entries. And Steam Man is like number 40-something in American novels. So there's 40-some-odd novels ahead of this one in the series. From what I understand, though, something else that these dime authors did, too, though, even although Ellis himself might have written under a number of pseudonyms, it seems like many of them actually wrote under a single name, and sometimes it was multiple authors. Yeah. Like, the supposed author of all the Tom Swift books is a guy named Victor Appleton. It was actually a whole bunch of different people. Oh, yeah, right, right. Writing over a period of, of like, a few decades even. I think that series lasted for a really long time. Mm -hmm. There's, like, hundreds and hundreds of Tom Swift stories, and you got to think, yeah, they're probably not all by the same person. Like, he would have <laughs> right. to be working so hard. He would be yeah. a slave chained to a primitive typewriter or something, mm -hmm. just churning out all these Tom Swift books. But obviously, the publisher wants some continuity, and they actually created, I, I don't know how much biography they put into it, probably not a lot, but they're like, 
yeah, this Victor Appleton is one guy, and it's really not, but just somebody they created. Yeah, it's a marketing gimmick. Yeah, again, there's not a lot to say about Steam Man, really. I knew not to expect too much, so I can't really say I was disappointed with it. Like I said, I did want it to be more violent. <laughs> it's like to justify some of the other stuff, kind of almost maybe. Yeah. Just go all out. It's kind of almost like, I mean, I I, I don't know what is a another example like some of the Italian ripoffs of The Exorcist. They just go that much further to the point where it's like ridiculous, and you almost have to admire them because it's like just so over the top. Yeah. The Exorcist is like supposed to be a serious movie about child neglect and catholicism and stuff like that and, and all the ripoffs are just like no uh <laughs> devil possession and titties right yeah, right it's like really <laughs> over the top and you kind of got to be like yeah all right <laughs> that's cool yeah uh so yeah i mean i wanted more i don't know like some actual encounters with the natives might have been cool like yeah but that actually, doesn't really happen here at all this is no. very oriented towards a more juvenile audience and it feels very tame in that yeah and when I say encounters, like, I mean, maybe somebody sneaks up on him and knocks him out, or one thing I was I was considering might have happened, and, and I could picture somebody like Howard doing this too, would be like that huge hunter or something, made a deal with the natives to, like, capture the steam man yeah, or something right. like that. Like, right. I almost thought it was going to go that way. Yeah. And he just kept bringing up the natives, but, like, all, it was all from a distance. It was all, like, nobody actually met. Yeah. At any point. Yeah. And so it was really kind of disappointing in that sense because I, I wanted more hands-on conflict i guess right and the conflict that was there was easily brushed aside the pretty much yeah steam man either scares the natives off or baldy gets in some shots with his rifle and that's basically it the our heroes are never really in any real danger nobody gets shot nobody's in any danger of dying yeah. beyond the fact that they're surrounded or something but they seem to easily get out of it every time yeah and the boy blows up the steam man at the end and like there's various other points in the story where the author kind of describes that he has a connection with it almost like he feels like his father or something like that even yeah. though it's an inanimate thing but then when that explosion happens there's not really any internal thoughts about it yeah it's more like and then even he doesn't say, I'll build another one that's even better. It's just this like passing thing in the last two paragraphs yeah. where he just kind of sums up <laughs> how everybody went their separate ways and stuff yeah. like that. And, yeah. and it's like, okay, we didn't need a nice long goodbye, but at least show us what the boy's thinking. Uh, right. <laughs> no, there, there's no look into anybody's thoughts in here, and no. I don't think anybody really has any thoughts aside from get the gold. Get the gold and leave my mother to fend for herself for few months there and worry about me and <laughs> right yeah so i yeah. mean it is interesting in the sense that the mecha aspect of this huge piloted semi robot starts here kind of where it's a western story with some very very thin sci-fi trappings on top of it yeah but i guess you gotta like we were describing the new york steam man and like how the inventors kind of press kit it was basically saying how it can save all this labor and stuff like that. Yeah, right. You gotta wonder, did people actually think that there would be somebody inside the Steam Man, or did they think that it operated by itself and somehow commands were issued to it? The drawings of the Steam Man in the patent and the photograph of it does not have a human driver in the huh. way that it's described here, where in the novel it... I got the sense that he's like riding on the steam man's back or something. Well, yeah, like that. yeah. There's a carriage, yeah, thing right. that he kind of rides in, um, right. But the New York one, it's like pulling a carriage in the drawing and the photograph, right. So there would have had to be a way to, and this is something that he's gotten into in the other stories we're doing, even Automata a little bit. But like, there would have to be a way to command it if there was no human operator inside. There would have to be some way of controlling it, which right. seems actually the thing that would be kind of beyond the capabilities of the time for the most part. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess there could be mechanical ways of doing it, but you'd still have to be screwing a key in and out of its ear or something like that, like the way right. Hoffman describes. But I mean, even basic locomotion on anything other than like a totally straight track would be totally infeasible. And even right. that would be pushing it for the time. Especially when you already have the railroad, which already does movement on a straight plane. 
and I think the idea here was to get it to move across non-railroad, non-paved oh, yeah. roads, and that's just totally, totally impractical for the technology available at the time. So full autonomous movement is still a ways away. Oh, yeah, by far. And like I said, it's unclear whether the inventor of the New York Steam Man was a con man or if he actually believed in the project and believed in what it could do. That's just so hard to tell from a couple newspaper accounts. Yeah, I mean, you'd think there would have been more if the idea was really, it had meaning to it and it would have taken off. Right. Maybe, or somebody would have bought it from him or something. Right? Yeah. It'd be interesting to see, like, if, for example, Edison had something to say about it. Yeah, which is something we'll be covering later on in a fictionalized version of Edison, but I don't think yeah. the real world Edison ever did any... Steam. Not just Steam Man, but Automata in general. He had a couple talking dolls, which oh, yeah. might serve as the model for some acoustic stories that come up later, but I don't think he ever really tried anything with what would be considered early robotics or early automata. So that's pretty much uh, Steam Man's historical curiosity. Don't really recommend unless you're interested in the frontier literature of for children, I guess. Yeah, uh, I mean, it is quite short and was wildly popular, spawning basically an entire subgenre of stories that we'll see later. But on its own, it doesn't really hold up that well. No, I mean, there's a lot better action adventure type stuff even from the time period yeah i mean it's totally unrelated to automata and stuff but we're still going to be covering h rider haggard's she at some point during this podcast yes that's like an, an adventure classic that's somewhat contemporary a little bit later than this one but not by much yeah other authors were also doing pretty so-called red-blooded adventure type stories that had more guts to them i think oh even jules verne for the most part was an adventure author true I don't know if he did any American Western Frontier stuff. I don't know how popular that was in France uh, at the time. but So he did a Civil War book. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I think I mentioned it in the Moon podcast briefly, but I can't remember the name of it now. But it's basically uh, Confederates versus Union soldiers, hmm. kind of. And the Confederates are the bad guys. Yeah, right. Uh, it's an adventure story. Interesting. It's kind of later, I guess, maybe. I think it's probably, uh, I'm not sure what year it was published, but it looked like it was a later period book almost, so... And we're around that time, too, with Steam Man. Yeah, 1868, which was published around the same time Byrne was publishing his initial works that gained him an international reputation. Yeah, cool. So that's Steam Man. That's Steam Man for you. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll catch you in a minute. Florence McLanberg is probably the most obscure author we'll be covering tonight. Not much is known about her life. She was born in 1850 and died in 1934 and spent most of her life in the Chicago area. She wrote poetry under the name McLanberg Wilson, which appears to be slightly more popular than her fiction. With regards to fiction, she wrote a number of short stories in the 1870s, most of which were published in Scribner's Monthly, including The Automaton Ear. These were collected in the 1876 anthology. The Automaton Ear and Other Stories, and a book of her poetry, The Little Flag on Main Street, under the Wilson pseudonym, was published in 1917. The Automaton Ear was initially published in the May 1873 issue of Scribner's, and has been republished in a few science fiction anthologies. It seems to be her only story that is science fiction adjacent. A L.W. Curry Incorporated rare book listing describes the other stories appearing in the Automaton Ear anthology as being gothic fantasy. It's certainly something I'd like to read more of. While yeah. it doesn't look like the Automaton Ear and other stories has ever been republished, it is public domain and available for free in its entirety on Google Books. Or if you'd like an original, you can purchase it from the aforementioned rare bookseller for $250 as of November 2020. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It looks like the Automaton Ear is the only one of her stories that has received any kind of attention whatsoever. While the others are supposedly gothic fantasy i don't know to what extent any of them have been read anthologized or republished they don't seem to have been reprinted yeah certainly yeah. any reference i can find to her work is in the context of the automaton ear though it does seem like her poetry was more popular at the time 
And given that she only really seemed to have written fiction in the 1870s, she was probably writing poetry for the latter half of her life. So it'd be an interesting figure to dig more into, because as we'll see, I think the automaton ear really has a lot of cool things going for it that would lend itself well to supposed gothic fantasy. So the story opens up with an anonymous narrator, a college professor enjoying a beautiful warm summer's day. He loses himself in a book, kind of half paying attention to the book and half enjoying what's going on in the day, but he's startled by a passage pertaining to sound, which is, quote, as a particle of the atmosphere is never lost, so sound is never lost. A strain of music or a simple tone will vibrate in the air forever and ever, decreasing according to a fixed ratio. The diffusion of the agitation extends in all directions, like the waves in a pool, but the ear is unable to detect it beyond a certain point. It is well known that some individuals can distinguish sounds, which to others under precisely similar circumstances are wholly lost. Thus the fault is not in the sound itself, but our organ of hearing, and a tone once in existence is always in existence. Jennifer Janacek, lecturer at the Rhetoric Department of the University of Iowa, notes that this passage comes from mathematician Charles Babbage, from the Ninth Bridgewater Treatise, a fragment from 1837, titled On the Permanent Impression of Our Worlds in Actions on the Globe We Inhabit. Later landmarks in sound development include the 1857 phone autograph, a mechanical device which could record sound but not play it back, Helmholtz's seminal 1863 paper on the sensations of tone as a physiological base for the theory of music, and after this story was published, Edison's 1877 phonograph, which was the first device which was able to play back sound. So McLandberg's story kind of appears at the midpoint between Helmholtz and Edison, both between music and sound being this thing that could possibly be recorded and played back, though at this point in time, it was only be able to be recorded and at that in a rather low fidelity and not available for playback. So it's kind of still theoretical at this point. The story doesn't actually mention that that's a Babbage quote. Did, no, it did, doesn't. Where did you find that? So I was doing some research on line and I came across this blog written by Professor Janacek at the University okay. of Iowa, where she talks in depth about the Babbage connection, which also I did not make. Oh, interesting. I'm okay. familiar with Babbage's work with yeah. Ada Lovelace on the theoretical mechanical computers, which the two of them devised together, but were never built. But apparently he was quite a prolific author and wrote about a lot of other theoretical mathematical concepts. Apparently sound and this idea of sound propagating through the air and never really going away, but just decreasing to such an infinitesimal level of smallness that it's not discernible to the human ear. Almost adding a fourth dimensional aspect to sounds transmission. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we'll see this idea come up again later, but this is the central idea behind the story that propels the future action. And the professor is really captivated by this idea. And he thinks about the possibility of hearing all recorded sounds throughout history. And he's intent on making a device that amplifies the ear in a similar fashion to how microscopes can amplify the eye. He purchases an ear trumpet, which is a horn-shaped hearing aid device that gained widespread use in the 18th century. And he begins working on such an instrument. In an abandoned church as a test ground, he decides to use metals instead of wood to conduct the sound better. And he's immediately struck by the discordant chaos of all the magnified sounds penetrating his ear at once. This makes him feel like a failure, and he begins to grow detached from academia, but doesn't abandon the idea completely. After tinkering with it some more, he picks out bits of sound in ancient Hebrew, which he realizes are passages from the Bible being spoken. So he's hearing these events from biblical Israel that were spoken three, 4,000 years ago, now in real time. He hears a child drowning, and realizes that all the sounds from history will show him not just these wonderful historic events, but also some horrible tragedies as well. Listening some more, he hears some sailors from 1745, and he becomes completely obsessed with the machine, wanting to keep it for himself, not showing it to anyone. It's all he can think about. He wants to hoard all these discoveries for himself. He can't eat, he can't sleep, his appearance grows wildly unkempt, and he's completely alienated from regular society. By the autumn, 
Rumors have spread all around town that he's completely crazy, and he hears children talking about him, making fun of him. After seeing a mute deaf servant named Mother Flynn's, he decides to test the instrument on her. Initially, she's afraid, but she becomes curious, and as she puts it to her ear, she's immediately rejuvenated in attitude and appearance. She has an ecstatic transport. Yeah, yeah. She's hearing for the first time in 70 years, and it just totally takes her back in time. She immediately becomes obsessed with it, and in a completely animalistic fashion, refuses to give it back and runs away with it. And she's pursued by the narrator. They get in a fight in which the narrator strangles her. He dumps her body in a tomb and begins to hear her over and over in the instrument. Every time he listens to it, her voice is all he can hear. It's haunted by her ghost. And he can't stand it anymore, and he's going to throw it out when all of a sudden a beetle falls out of the instrument. At this, the narrator hears the normal sounds coming through the instrument, and he sees Mother Flint's actually walking around outside, and he goes back to the graveyard where he dumped her body, but he can't lift up the tomb. And the story ends on this ambiguous note, where the narrator feels absolved from the murder, and his obsession with hearing the sounds throughout time is broken, but it's not entirely clear whether the events of the murder was a hallucinatory imagination, or if the ending resolve itself is a hallucination. It just yeah. kind of ends on this vague note, and that's it. Yeah, and I don't know, even the church, like the windows were boarded up the way they were in the beginning. So it almost seemed like the whole thing might have been a hallucination. Yeah, it's very <laughs> unclear. Yeah, that was, to me, that was the disappointing element of the story. I mean, I like ambiguity, but that was a little bit like, I don't know. I guess the alternative was basically pulling a diamond lens. Right. And like just following that kind of course into madness and him ending up in an asylum somewhere. Yeah. But I, I, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, it was cool, though. It had a lot of interesting ideas to it. and She's very good at imagery, too. I was really impressed with her prose style. Yeah, it was definitely among the strongest prose that we saw this segment, Right, I think. And that's what makes me want to read more of her gothic fantasy stories. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to see what those are like as well. It sounds like they're hard to find, but... Uh... Yeah, well, like I said, the Google Books anthology, which contains all of her prose, is... Oh, right, the Automaton Year is available in... Uh... Yeah. Yeah, even though it's never been reprinted, it's public domain and it's one of the works that have been digitized, so anybody can freely read the entirety of her fiction. I think her poetry is also public domain, but I didn't look to check if it's available on the internet. Yeah, so this idea of being able to hear all the sounds of history is really interesting, and I almost, I guess, I didn't really think about this today, but I almost feel like this is actually a good response to the novel that we're doing later. Yeah. Almost. We'll be coming to that shortly. But the actual subject is brought up there as well. And the author of that book spends a good deal of time talking frustratedly about how it can't be done. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and so here's this guy who came up with, well, really the author, Florence herself, came up with the idea of actually a device that can do that. Now... It's very unclear to me how this device would even work. Like, yeah. it just seems very, like, doesn't have any controls on it. Like, how would you localize this sound? And the fact that he hears passages from the Bible in Hebrew seems extremely convenient. Right. <laughs> Why would he be hearing that? I don't Especially know. Especially something uh, presumably 5,000 miles away from right. 5,000 years ago. And as sounds propagate through waves to the atmosphere, it's really all dependent on how the wind blows where and when. Mm. But I think there is also a religious um, connotation to this story. Like, it's not overt. It's not, God is not mentioned that much. But there also seems to be this obsession that's taken over the protagonist. It allows him to see beyond, maybe to even get a taste of God's omniscience, so to yeah. speak. I mean, he is picking up passages from the Bible inside a church. Right, inside a church, exactly. And... At the end of a the story, there's the mute and her murder almost seems like if the whole thing is a hallucination, it almost seems like God is showing him something or testing him in some way. Right. right? So it does seem like that's what we should take away from it. And unfortunately, like in 2020, when we think of device that can pick up all kinds of different sounds, we think, okay, so we think automatically how would this device work and how would it how could you control it to pinpoint the exact sounds you wanted to hear that wasn't important to her no it doesn't really go into much detail beyond mentioning the ear trumpet which right. is a pretty ingenious device especially for how old it is 
while it did gain popularity oh, yeah. in the 1700s, I think the first models and concept of it were developed in the 1600s. And I guess with all the developments in microscopy going around the time, which we saw reflected in the diamond lens, which constantly name-checked that Dutch guy who was a big microscopy... Leeuwenhoek. Yeah, right. Figure. Yeah. I guess McLanberg could have been inspired by the same ideas, but applying the principles to another sense rather than vision. Yeah, that seems to make sense. And I did definitely feel like the diamond lens was a very similar story. Yeah. This one was just maybe a bit better written and didn't have any anti-Semitic stereotypes. But... Right. And also, it seemed less ridiculous in a way. I mean, the diamond lens got pretty wacky towards the end. with. The... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this one, I thought the hallucinatory whatever scenes at the end where the narrator is basically going insane, I thought it was well done with the atmosphere and the tension in the story. It was well done, but the payoff was disappointing. So the payoff the, was it didn't disappointing. Really, it, it didn't really come through the way I would have liked. Right. Uh, but I don't really know exactly what I would have liked in this case. So yeah. it's okay, but in the end, I couldn't really buy all that because it just seemed like, oh, the murder didn't really happen, kind of... Okay, I guess good for him, right? Yeah. <laughs> like maybe what's he's going to go back to teaching now? Right. Uh, again, I, I feel like there was more of a religious resonance to this than what at first appears. Mm -hmm. Like I just feel like the whole thing was almost like a, an exercise from God to sort of put this man through something that would maybe humble him in some way. Right. Almost. And and the end, like. It does have a dreamlike sort of feeling to it, and I just think of myself sometimes when I wake up from a really bad dream, and I, there's this huge sense of relief, like, oh god, that didn't really happen. That's so <laughs> nice, yeah. right? And and there's it's kind of that feeling, like he's woken up from this really long days, and the birds are chirping, and it's like, okay, everything might be all right. Yeah, and it almost seems like that was the whole essence of the story was this trial from the divine power. The idea of the device is pretty interesting, and that probably what sticks in our consciousness now most, because sound technology has actually come a long way, and although we can't hear the sounds of history, we can certainly pick up sounds from a, a long way and transmit oh, yes. them a long way. So, yeah. And that idea was already in public consciousness in the 1870s. So the telephone was invented, was it early 1880s? No, 1878. No, it was 1878 or something like that. So, yeah, right around this time, I'm sure that was something that she had sort of considered because I'm sure there was some talk about it already, you know, in the yeah. press and stuff like that, or that kind of invention. Right. Bell was working on the Harmonic Telegraph in 1871, and he filed okay. his telephone patent in 1876. Right. So McLanberg wrote the initial version in Scribner's, which I'm assuming is the exact same thing that was republished in her anthology and the other science fiction anthologies that have picked up on the story. But yeah. it would have been before there was a working telephone and working telephone service, but certainly there would have been news and press about the people working on the telephone because like we'll see in later times, Bell and Gray and a lot of these people did things quite publicly. And we're going to be talking a little bit about a surprising figure that you wouldn't associate with science fiction, but who is actually really interested in the telephone and the development of the telephone, as well as many other inventions. Mark Twain, yeah, Samuel Clemens, probably one of the first private citizens in America to actually own a telephone. He was somebody who was really interested in all these new inventions and often wrote about them. He wrote about his first experiences with a typewriter as well. He was one of the first authors to adopt the mechanical typewriter. Hmm. This is something that he was really interested in and wrote a lot about. There's a great photo of him hanging out with Nikola Tesla, too. Yeah, you mentioned that, and that <laughs> is pretty amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this was a good one. This was a good little story. Again, it's short. It's a pleasure to read. I did find it a little disappointing, ultimately, but... The prose style was good, and that made up for it. Right, and it was also very short. And, and when you think about it as a religious test, it actually kind of works a little better, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, it kind of has a certain the story, kind of gains more shape. Yeah. And it's not just like, oh, well, that was pointless. Like, the horror was for nothing, and we don't know if the device was real. Like, I do think that she probably had a pious disposition toward this idea a little bit. Yeah, I would have been so. But she doesn't belabor the point which is kind of cool right so it's there 
but it's not like not deliberately spelled out for you so much. Mm -hmm. So I think it works really well. Yeah. And like you said, the whole thing does have this dreamlike feel, which I think is really cool from a pro standpoint. And from a content standpoint, it does explore the idea of magnification of senses in ways that not a lot of other of these automaton stories do. A lot of them are concerned with physical locomotion and not necessarily the sensory input. Yeah, she actually thinks about the concepts of recording elements of history, and I think even now, like, that's very attractive to people. Oh, you know, absolutely. We, we wish yeah. we had, even our own lives, like, we had recordings of these precious moments from yeah. when we were young and all this stuff, and even that you see a lot of resonances is in modern media, like Black Mirror did an episode about that kind yep. of concept where everyone had a chip in their brains that recorded pretty much everything. And they could relive all these old moments from their right. lives and stuff. Project them onto their TV. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And of course, going back into ancient history and biblical times and, and so on. Yeah. Who wouldn't want to hear Cicero speak? Yeah. And this is a concept that we'll be revisiting very shortly. Yep. So we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with another short one. The next work we'll be covering was written by Eduardo Ladislao Olmberg, who was born in 1852 and died in 1937. And from what I can tell, he was the most prolific author of 19th century Argentine science fiction. His primary occupation was not as a writer, but that of a biologist. And he extensively surveyed Argentina's ecoregions and described its natural biodiversity and depth. In 1878, he co-founded the Argentine Naturalist, a biological magazine, and was appointed the director of the Buenos Aires Zoo in 1888, where he served until 1904. He wrote several stories in the 1870s and 1880s, which are discussed in Rachel Haywood Ferreira's The Emergence of Latin American Science Fiction. And unless somebody beats me to it, I plan to translate 1875's The Marvelous Journey of Mr. Knickknack to the Planet Mars into English for what I can tell will be the first time, which we'll cover in a future yeah. episode. So nobody listening to this beat Nate to the <laughs> translation. I don't know, we'll be very angry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this one, Horatio Calabine, or The Automatons, is a shorter work from 1879, and it's light and comic in tone. And there's a translation by Ana Lucia Alonso and Sam Smiley, freely available online. It opens up with a brief argument between Burgomaster Hypnock and his nephew, where the Burgomeister says that everything is conceivable, but not everything is possible. It's a dinner conversation. Yeah. And it's very brief. And yeah. like a lot of the things in this story are very brief sketches, and it kind of jumps around very quickly. The entire story, I think, is four or 5,000 words, and there's several scenes, so there are these very brief vignettes of 100 words, a couple hundred words each. The next scene, it jumps to the 15th birthday party for the Burgermeister's daughter, Louisa. The narrator, Fritz, is a cousin of the Burgermeister, and at the table, the guests begin to discuss losing one's center of gravity which is a very strange concept of really floating strange. away. <laughs> so conveniently after the discussing this, a strange guest, Calabang, pronounced similar to Shakespeare's Caliban, is brought in, and he moves awkwardly and unnaturally. He says he has no weight, and he's able to take a seat in these impossible positions anywhere he pleases. The Burgermeister's secretary suggests that he's hollow, and later on in a different scene, we see the Burgermeister trailing two men down the street. He witnesses one of them insert a key in the back of another and starts winding him up. And we say that this is Kalabong, the automaton, and his creator, Oscar Baum. Baum writes to Hypnox, saying that he's on the verge of making a brain that functions by itself as a means of national pride to eclipse the achievements of Thomas Edison. This letter is then relayed to Fritz, and the two are invited to Baum's house and studio. They're greeted by Baum, and Hypnox tells Baum that Kalabong's awkward movements were a dead giveaway, but Fritz sees something that Hypnox doesn't. Baum isn't really Baum at all, but he's a Baum automaton. The real Baum then comes out, and like Hoffman, he introduces them to an automated scene where various automatons are performing music, there's some sword fighting and painting, then it culminates with automatons resembling Hypnox's entire family acting out the 15th birthday party scene from earlier in the story in this weird form of mockery. 
Baum says there's several thousands of these automatons all over the world. And the story skips, I guess, a couple years, maybe a couple months into the future, and takes us to another party. This time it's the wedding between Luisa and Hermann Blagerdorf, where they receive Kalabong as a wedding gift from Fritz. Fritz says that Kalabong is the only person who can be trusted, that he's installed automatons in various positions of power over the world, and that they should be able to rest easy having someone to watch over them. And that's pretty much the entire story. It's very short and very light and comic in tone, but it's also incredibly strange. It's very light, but it's very strange. Yeah. Uh-huh. I don't know. This is probably one of the strangest things that we've read yet. Yeah. In my opinion. And actually, like, the implications are a bit unsettling. Yeah, it's told in a somewhat comic tone, especially in the beginning. Right. This guy has quite an interesting imagination. It doesn't seem like nowadays some of the concepts might not seem as outlandish, I guess. The idea of duplicates spread all over the world and stuff like that. And again, people that are. They appear like automata, but you can't quite tell whether they are or not. People are, like, drawing all kinds of weird conclusions about people that they're with. And, like, there's the whole question is, like, is that a real person or is it an automaton? Right. Yeah. And it's just so, like, there's this feeling almost of paranoia that starts to develop. But the story doesn't really – it's so short that it doesn't carry on with any of those themes to the natural conclusion that you would expect today, maybe. Right. But it's – the implications are there. And the fact that he does it in a bunch of little vignettes is kind of cool. And it makes it a little more it's sort of this thing that kind of sticks in your head as an idea that you just sort of think about. In a way, it was hard for me to get a lot of feeling from this. But at the same time, it was it's just so imaginative and strange. Yeah, yeah. It was really cool. <laughs> in a way, it was probably my favorite thing that we read. Yeah. And it's so short. I would say of all the stories, it's probably the closest to being wholly satisfying in terms of an imaginative work. Right. In a strange way. Yeah, and it really accomplishes a lot, even though the word count is very short. Yeah. So the opening scenes, which are much more comic in tone than the later, although it does maintain a lighthearted right. tone throughout, is very similar to the Poe story we read in the Moon episode, where yeah, yeah, Poe yeah. makes a lot of funny Dutch names making fun of the Dutch, where here Holmberg is making fun of the Germans with German. these absurd German Although names. he seems like he had some German heritage himself, going yeah. and judging by his name. Right. And possibly also Eastern European. I don't know. It's, it's just a very strange name our author has, Mr. Holmberg, Senior Holmberg. Yeah, I couldn't find oh, yeah. too much information about him, certainly not in English. I briefly looked at some of the Spanish sources, and yeah. a lot of the English stuff was just directly translated from that. So right. I think his biological work is probably more well-known, at least as far as the field goes, and probably yeah, that would make receptive sense. at the time than his fiction. But he wrote a lot of it. There's maybe half a dozen or so at least works of short stories and novellas mr knickknack isn't that long from what i could tell it's around 30 to 40,000 words so it would put it at a roughly i don't know 100 to 120 page count or so whereas this it could fill up 5 10 printed pages at, at most yeah and he did some other shorter stories as well but yeah he doesn't seem to be too well known at least in the english-speaking world so it's quite a, an extensive tradition of argentine fantastic fiction going well into the 20th century with jorge luis borges there does seem to be a bit of a tradition uh, and there are other writers as well i don't think like i'm not that well versed in it no it, it doesn't seem to be a lot that the english-speaking world is and the Ferrera book that I mentioned is a really, really outstanding resource for this stuff. And I've been taking a look into some of it for future episodes we're doing. And I've been able to find some English translations and some of the works are not translated into English. But a good chunk of it, the original Spanish texts are available online. So we're going to try to import some of that stuff as well as some of the shorter stories in addition to the knickknack into yeah. English where we can. But the Ferreira book is, yeah, it's an incredible resource and it has a comprehensive bibliography of every Latin American country and anything that could be possibly considered science fiction adjacent. And Argentina and Mexico are the two largest 
sources of output for this stuff in the 19th century. So I don't know if this has been anthologized anywhere in particular, but of course it is available online for free in that translation that was mentioned earlier. Yeah, and it was a relatively recent translation too from I think 2012 or 2013. Yeah. I think it came from somewhere in academia. I don't know what schools they're affiliated with, but I found it on academia.edu or something like that. But it's freely available online and it has some neat illustrations that they got to go along with it. And they did a pretty good job with the translation, I have to say. Their notes were pretty extensive and they included text in uh, the introduction in both English and Spanish. They talk a lot about the Spanish and how formal it is. And they talk a lot about a certain ambiguity about how certain relations are, like familial yeah. relations, whether it's uncle or cousin. Right. And I kind of didn't get the sense of any of that from the translation, so I don't really know. Obviously, they like that's part of a translator's work is to make the reading smooth, right? But I just, I just, right. I didn't get the sense of what they were saying exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to dialect and local accent, especially yeah. when you're dealing with a language like Spanish, which spreads thousands of miles. And right. the colonial empire was in the Americas since basically the late 1400s. So there's a fair amount of dialect shift between European Spanish and Latin American Spanish, and probably even more so in the late 1800s before there was any kind of consistent radio or television news yeah. media. No recordings, no radio, no television. Right, right. exactly. Uh, so yeah. a lot of it was probably local slang and dialect, which might be obscure on its face even to a native Spanish speaker, depending on where you're from. Yeah, I mean, the word that was used specifically was formal. And in the context of this, I don't I don't really understand what that means, I guess. Yeah, I guess maybe more of a stiff academic style, but I mean, I, the English translation felt very light in tone. Yeah, um, so yeah. So I didn't read this one in Spanish, so I'm... So I didn't get the sure. sense of, like, yeah. formal English presentation that's for sure i mean i'm not criticizing them i just didn't really understand i mean maybe if i looked at the original spanish i probably would mm -hmm. understand but i just it, it, to me it didn't seem like what i would associate with extremely formal storytelling or formal language necessarily so yeah. i don't i don't really know what they meant yeah i guess and and that's something that's puzzled me a little bit while reading because I, I wasn't sure. I'm glad that they tried to explain the translation process, though, because I do appreciate that kind of thing. Yeah, they did a very good job with the introduction, I thought. Yeah, I mean, when we did the huge short story episode where we covered like 10 short stories and we did a bunch of Russian stuff and you went into describing your translation process yeah. and stuff, that was a valuable part of the presentation, I thought, because it's good to know how these things work. And obviously, yeah. every individual work is different. And has oh, yeah, for sure. Style yeah. and presentation. Yeah. Spanish is going to be so much easier to deal with than Russian. <laughs> than Russian? Yeah. yeah. I was looking at, not Knickknack, but another author from Mexico, Amado Nervo, who wrote a couple novellas and short stories, and he wrote this very short one called The Final War, which is like oh. this post-apocalypse type Sounds pretty story. Epic. Which, uh, <laughs> it's, it's only like two or three thousand words, so okay. I can knock that out, no problem. But the closeness of Spanish to English is much higher than yeah, certainly Russian, helps, yeah. <laughs> which definitely, yes, it definitely helps a lot because so much of Spanish is cognates with English, whereas Russian, the vocabulary climb is much steeper. Right. It makes the word choice a little bit more... I don't know that I would suggest spending time translating something as long as Nicknock in Russian. Oh yeah, no. Though we did identify a couple works that were these kind of traveler narratives which yeah. uh, again repeat themselves over and over again which is why we decided not to pursue that angle let's let somebody else take yeah, care of that one e exactly but <laughs> um there's certainly no shortage yeah. of good russian translations of science fiction work from slightly before and after the soviet revolution and we're yeah. going to be looking at that stuff in considerable depth later on but it's interesting that russia doesn't really break free from that traveler mold until almost the turn of the century, really. I think a lot of the 19th century stories that come out of Russia are these kind of traveler still stories. still have the traveler Where as the Latin American stories involve a whole wide range of topics. We got Automata in this story. Ferrer talks about human magnetism and mesmerism as being a theme in a lot of them. I think the way Nick Knack gets to Mars is he like, 
transmogrifies himself through this bizarre metaphysical soul journey, not any means of physical travel. So I think mm. it's going to get quite weird in places. Yeah. So it's so. definitely an interesting area that I think is very, very overlooked by the English speaking world based on how much seems to be out there and the wide range of topics, themes, and philosophical ideas that are pursued. It's not just traveler stories and utopias. Yeah, I'm looking forward to delving more into that because I certainly didn't know anything about it before we started this. And there's this whole undercurrent of Latin American science fiction and science fiction related stuff. I have read a lot of Borges short stories and some of them kind of have some science fictional elements and even one of the books that I think we probably will refer to a bit the anthology the big book of science fiction right does actually have a Borges story in it and he's another example of an author that's not not necessarily associated with science fiction all the time but even those anthologizers obviously considered it and thought yeah this story belongs there and I can kind of see that so and then there's obviously something more evident like this story for instance which is clearly a science fiction story yeah very much so and it's so short and so almost like it could just be something that somebody thought of in a day but there's so much that it brings up as a possibility and it doesn't really explore a lot of these things to any real extent but the mere fact that they are brought up at all seems quite significant yeah, and I think the actual science behind the automatons resembles your basic toys that you'd see all over. You know, you wind up the little doll and it walks. Yeah. But the ideas but it presents so of right replacing humans to the point where another human can't tell that can't it's an automata, tell. which right. is a major difference between some of the other stories we've read. The Sandman, it was obvious that everybody was... Yeah, Nathaniel couldn't tell. But right, everybody but everybody else, else could, could, yeah. Right, right. Um, in Hoffman's Automata, it was very clear. It was billed as an automaton. It was just yes. part of the spectacle of how lifelike it was. Even then, I felt like the distinction was fragile. Like, the people saying these things, it was from their point of view, and how reliable was that? I'm not really sure, you know? Right. It's like, somebody can bitch all they want for instance about music produced by machines not having the human feeling to it yeah. but if they really don't understand music and what goes into it how do they really judge that is it a really shallow kind of judgment the idea that everybody throughout the world in government and the positions of power have been replaced by these automatons is a little bit unsettling because it makes you wonder what happened to the people who held these positions in the first yeah. place? So apparently oh, there's yeah. thousands of people all over the world who have been replaced. And what has this Fritz been up to? Well, it definitely reminds me of like, the, I got to keep making this connection at least once an episode. But like there was this Doctor Who story from the 80s where there was a bunch of weird throwaway stuff. And it was a Dalek story called Resurrection of the Daleks. And it had all these things in it that were like almost throwaway lines, but that had all these weird implications. And one of them was that all kinds of government leaders and important people had been replaced by duplicates. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even like a part of the story. It's just like dropped in at the very end. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> shit, that's not good. What's going to happen with that? Right. And it never right. like it's. <laughs> yeah. It's, and that was the first time I remember hearing about a concept like that. And of course, Later on, you see that in various alien invasion type stories, right? And, and I became more familiar with the, the tropes and stuff. And it was like, right, even fantasy series now, there's this series called The Prince of Nothing that I remember uh, reading. It's like a, a trilogy. I think there's some other books or something. It was written by this guy called R. Scott Backers, like a Canadian fantasy writer. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a lot like a, it reminds me a lot of Dune, but a more fantasy kind of setting without a lot of really overt science fiction. But there's like alien, almost like alien shapeshifters that have basically taken over all these positions of power. <laughs> and they're not automata, but it's still this uncanny feeling like you don't right. know who's real and who's yeah. not. 
Kind but of. I mean, here we have, even though it's an offhand mention at the end of a comic story, but it's a full fledged automaton global conspiracy. Yeah. In it's so weird. Eighteen seventy nine. You don't even quite know like who, what exactly is driving all this. Yeah. Like, I guess it could be this Oscar guy, but probably not. No, yeah. It seems you to know, be Fritz that's the driving hand behind uh, the replacement yeah. of real world people, whereas Baum mostly seems to be content with playing around with his musical and other <laughs> dancing performances. Yeah. But it's like, how did Fritz get on this track? Like, yeah. It's so, it's so, there's not a lot of background there. And it just, it is actually cool because it has that aspect of a good horror story that leaves you kind of wondering. Yeah. And it like leaves you thinking about it afterwards and wondering. So it has this comic tone, but there are definitely disturbing implications. And I think that that was something that we actually brought up way, way back in, in the Mary Shelley episode, I think, where sometimes it's like, yeah, the difference between what's human and what's not is up to the beholder in a way. And yeah. the translators of Horatio Karabang mentioned the Turing test. And pretty much, yeah. That's something that you have to pretty much talk about at some point when you're talking about man and machine. Yeah. And the whole idea that if you as a human being cannot tell that the thing that you were confronting is a machine, is there really a difference? Is the difference that you think is significant really that significant if you can't tell? And that is coming up again in the next story that we're doing. The last work we'll be covering tonight, and by far the longest, probably longer than everything else we've read tonight combined, is yeah. Tomorrow's Eve, written by Jean-Marie Matthias Felipe Auguste, Comte de Vier, de la Isla Adam. So, again, I apologize to our French listeners. I'll be That's Auguste. Auguste. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Auguste Vier, Lille Adam. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, it's Quite a mouthful, even for a French speaker, I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a very lofty title. Um, but he was born in 1838 and died in 1899. And from his lofty name comes lofty opinions about himself and his place <laughs> in the yeah. world, which we'll definitely see in so, tomorrow's So, uh, by far, of all the people that we're doing, this guy is the most interesting and the most problematic and the most, like... Everything about him informs what he wrote. Yeah, so it kind of reminds me like of Bergerac, where in real life he was this exaggerated, almost picaresque, roguish character. The two are definitely very different in how they approach things, but yeah. he feels like, I don't know, this exaggerated performer who just doesn't really care about social norms at all and feels like he's so far above everybody else that he can do whatever he wants, basically. Yeah, but the most frustrating thing about all this is that it doesn't really seem earned. Like, I mean, not that it maybe ever is, yeah. but it just seems, in the case of this guy in particular, it just seems like you know, the, the father, for example, was doing all this stuff for him, or right. for the family, and Auguste just didn't really seem to realize it, or he didn't care, or he, didn't, he just thought he earned all that stuff just by being born. Yeah, know. his literary output was not that prolific. I mean, compared to Ellis, who wrote more than 100 novels, Auguste did not. <laughs> he, not too much of his stuff is out there, and a lot of his stuff that he was famous for were these improvised performances. So the introduction to Tomorrow's Eve that we read, which was written by the translator Robert Martin Adams, yeah. And I should remark that it's the only translation we can recommend because there are several commercial translations out there that abridge about 40% of the novel out, and they change the character of Thomas Edison to Professor X, 
which I think might have been inspired by the Hoffman, but I don't know then again, about... I'm not entirely sure. It's kind of a generic yeah. mystery name. I think it probably wasn't just because Professor X or Dr. X is a thing that became common like in the 20th century. Right. There's like movies about Dr. X. In the 90s, there was a Doctor Who book that substituted. They kind of like were aiming for a Professor Quatermass like character, but they called yeah. it Professor X. Right. And it was like a TV show. Like it's kind of like a metafictional thing where there was a TV show in the book uh, named Professor X. And it was kind of like Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have been a thing, a longstanding thing. The translator wrote this introduction and it is a very biased introduction. He lays into him pretty hard. It is kind of funny because most translators, you would think they would kind of pump the book up, but he kind of, he doesn't necessarily not pump the book up, but he definitely doesn't pump VA up. No. <laughs> <laughs> but is it a complete translation of the novel and retains the original use of Edison in Menlo Park? So I should add though that the French title is Le Futur. It's not Tomorrow's Eve, and that is in right. fact the English title, which I think at first both you and I questioned, but as I actually read more of the book, it started to make more sense why yeah. he called it that. Right. So in English, when we hear a title like The Eve of the Future, The Future Eve, or Tomorrow's Eve, the first thing that came to my mind was Eve as in short for evening, which is the dawn right. of a new future age. It's or the dawn of a new like that. exactly. No, that's yeah. not what it means. It is no. referring to the biblical Eve. Right. And we're going to see themes of the nature of womanhood being central to this novel. Yeah, and I think that's why the translator made that choice to use Tomorrow's Eve instead. Right, and it's an unfortunate turn of phrase in English where it renders the original title almost ambiguous, yeah. uh, whereas yeah. I don't think other languages have that problem. Right. Sorry, I thought that was important to point out because that was a thing that had bugged me for the beginning. It was like, do we call this Future Eve? or Yeah, absolutely. Eve? Yeah. And I kind of realized that I think I understand why he decided that he wanted to translate that very specifically as Tomorrow's Eve, as right. in it's Tomorrow's Woman. Eve. Right. And it makes more sense within the context of the novel and the English language. Right. So I'm going to refer to it as Tomorrow's Eve throughout. That's the version we read. I think there are other unabridged translations out there, but I'm not entirely sure. Certainly none of the commercial ones or the one on Gutenberg are unabridged. The Adams one is the only one that seems to be easily commercially available and contains the full novel. But it's easy to see why they abridge a lot of stuff out. Yeah. Roughly 90% of the novel's plot is a conversation I'll get between into this. two characters. I have characters, some really strong but, opinions uh, about this novel. Yeah. <laughs> this, this novel was an interesting headache for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get there, we're going to talk about the man himself, who was part of a royal family that dates back to the 14th century. And after the revolution, like many other royal families, his family was reduced to poverty. And he was kind of looked at as the family's way back into being in polite established society through his literary talent. He entered into Parisian literary society at the age of 20 in 1858, and he briefly spent time with the Benedictines of the Abbey of Selesme, where his literary talents were allowed to flourish, and his father and his aunt really looked upon him as the one hope of restoring the family name. And he must have really let this go to his head in extreme ways. Yeah, I think the most ridiculous stunt that he pulled out of many was in 1862, King Otto of Greece was overthrown, and a state referendum was held to select a new monarch. So, Vier campaigns for this role himself, <laughs> and it doesn't appear that anybody took him seriously at all. But I he... am the king of Greece! Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what a weird... Thing to yeah, do. and Adams, the way he talks about this in the intro is just so deadpan, and so like yeah. his sarcasm is really <laughs> on full display. <laughs> but even with this kind of ridiculous stunt, people like Baudelaire, Mollyarm, Wagner all praise the genius, and because they themselves were successful artists, their praise contributed to his rising reputation. And during his life, he was extremely popular due to these. Improvised performances he put on in cafes, on the streets, or random social gatherings where he developed this character, Tribulat Bahamut, and it was described as being this popular, grotesque comic character, and it was very much at odds with the contemporary literary sphere that he was involved in. His performances were often mocked, but despite the fact they were incredibly popular. 
Due to the popularity that he experienced, he thought of himself as a genius above everybody else. In 1873, he was courting the daughter of a Count de Husse, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but in doing so, that. he recited a great deal of his poetry and his upcoming novel to her in a very excited state that it completely turned her off and left her running away frightened. And yeah. this experience formed the basis for the character of Alicia Clary in Tabarro Z. Which I think sounds probably very unfair, but yeah. <laughs> whatever. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to that. By the 1870s, his father began to rack up considerable debts, causing the family to live in poverty. And the way he makes it sounds is they were on his son's behalf. Yeah, right. I guess he was so convinced that his son was going to restore the family name to incredible riches and fame that he made all these very poor speculations that completely backfired on the family and pushed them further into financial ruin. Oh, man. I feel so bad for him. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so to add insult to injury, claims on genealogy in general due to the chaos of the Napoleonic era led for several contenders to the ancestral title of Villiers de la Isada. And it was in this time that he lost the title, further contributing to his low status and poverty. So during this rock bottom point is when he wrote Tomorrow's Eve, initially published in La Vie Moderne in 1885 and 1886 in serial form and then in monograph form in 1886. The novel itself began to revive interest in his work. And the work he had been in process in developing for several years, Axel, which was a drama, was starting to get published in sections across serialized magazines. However, right when his success started to come back, his health took a massive turn for the worse. Malnutrition and pulmonary weaknesses brought on by his poverty greatly deteriorated his health. And in his final days, he was pressured to marry his illiterate nurse by whom he had an illegitimate child. He died on August 19th, 1889, a few months before Axel was published in its entirety. Adams notes that Vier despised science and poorly understood it, but nevertheless was inspired by Edison's phonograph for its capabilities to bring the orchestra into a home listening situation. And as such, Thomas Edison is the main character of Tomorrow's Eve. Yeah, the real, the true Thomas Edison. Yeah, yeah. I probably never read this book about him. No, I was actually looking in the Edison papers for any references to the novel, and I couldn't find any, yeah. though. That doesn't necessarily prove a negative. No. It's probably unlikely that Edison was... It's probably not. I mean, and even now you see, uh, like, it seems like it would be possibly grounds for some kind of litigation, but you oh, see yeah. actual figures in books. I was just recently learning about this QAnon conspiracy stuff that's been going on lately and I guess there's a book published called Q the Awakening and like it's kind of narrated by Donald Trump but his name is never mentioned in the book but it's clearly him yeah right yeah uh, if his name was mentioned in the book that might be more problematic so right they, they yeah they don't liberally mention his name but it's like clearly supposed to be him so this is clearly very openly Thomas Edison. Yeah, yeah. He's named by name, and he's working in Menlo Park, um, yeah. which is where his first yeah, laboratory setting was. Yeah, the town isn't called Menlo Park anymore. The town is called Edison. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh, no, they, interesting. Okay. Yeah, they they yeah, changed I the name. Don't know how I missed that. Yeah. Interesting. While Villiers is said to little about science. It kind of reflects in the Edison of the novel, as the Edison of the novel isn't the Edison of the real world, and no. has a very poetical touch to his inventions. He spends a lot of time than... thinking about things that I don't think the real Edison would no. have thought about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this whole like automaton ear concept. Yeah, again, I thought like, hey, we should do this. Uh, we should do that after because there's this whole section of Tomorrow's Eve. That goes on and on, and VA goes on and on a lot. This whole section goes on and on about how Edison is really upset that his phonograph is not good enough to capture the sounds of history. This is an idea that really bothers him, apparently, like immensely. It bothers him that he can't record the sounds of Julius Caesar, and he can't record the Battle of Jericho, and he has no recordings of Cleopatra. Yeah, It's this real weird angst that makes no sense in terms of how i mean all right 
these are things that everybody probably thinks about at one time, but like it doesn't seem as though VA kind of thought maybe the invention in its own way is good enough. Like maybe there'll be great sounds in the future to record. Right. Maybe, I don't know. It's just it's a really weird thing to fixate on in that way. It's interesting. I think the year is, is obsessed with his own past greatness and the greatness of his ancestral name, <laughs> that royal lineage. And he yeah. really can't see anything of value in the present. Or I don't the know how likely it would be that he would have read Mick Landberg at the time. Scribner's was certainly a large magazine with a high amount of circulation, but well, that's probably true. in that's America. True. So I don't know how much it had circulation yeah. in France. I doubt that he read it, but I mean, I guess we don't know. Yeah. It certainly addresses the exact same concepts. Yeah. But Edison is approached with a much more poetical tone, certainly, than the real world Edison was. And Vier tells us this right away, saying, quote, the Edison of the present work, his character, his dwelling, his language, and his theories are and ought to be at least somewhat distinct from anything existing in reality. So, as this Edison bears resemblance only in name to the Edison of the real world and a couple other superficial similarities, which we'll cover when we get into the actual novel itself, but we're not going to go into Edison's biography here, as we're going to be covering him in depth when we do the future Edison 8 episode. Though it should be mentioned that at the point in his career when this novel was written, Edison was obviously an internationally known name for his electric lighting and photograph advancements. So the novel itself opens up with Edison, age 42, at his laboratory in Menlo Park, New Jersey. He's smoking some cigars and losing himself in thought, and what it would have been like to always have the phonograph recording sounds throughout human history. He hints at a new project, though, which we wouldn't trade for millions of phonographs but he's interrupted by a woman named Sawana over some sort of intercom system, and they mention somebody named Hadley. Edison alludes to needing a third living soul to finish the work, looking to invent the inner essence, and he starts to drift off in thought again, which I guess is something that Villiers Edison is prone to, it's musing again, about yeah. being born too late, and is again interrupted, this time by a bell. An employee at his New York office received a telegraph dispatch from a certain Lord Ewald, an old friend who saved his life and helped him out when he was at a low point. There doesn't seem to be quite a real-life analog for the relationship between Ewald and Edison, though Franklin Pope kind of comes close, who took real-world Edison in at a young age, letting him live and work in his basement in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Hmm. Pope's a really interesting figure, and we're going to be reading a short story by his younger brother Ralph Pope later down the line when we talk about telegraph fiction. But he wasn't an Englishman, right? No, he was an American. Yeah. Uh, Ewald is an Englishman, yeah. Lord Ewald. Ewald. Is definitely yes. an Englishman, yeah. 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 <laughs> if there was some inspiration for the circumstance between the two, like Edison of the novel not being the same thing as Edison of the real world, the Ewald of the novel is certainly not a character or personality analog of Franklin Pope. And we're going to see pretty quickly that it very much feels like a self insert character of Vier himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Edison instructs his son Dash, which is the real-world nickname for his son Thomas Jr., to admit Ewald when he arrives. Just lying around, Edison happens to have an amputated arm sitting there, and he starts musing again, recalling a system he developed to stop two speeding trains approaching one another that dispatchers ignore at the last second and cause a massive collision, killing hundreds of people. And it's one of the first glances we get at Edison's questionable ethical character. <laughs> Yeah. He continues musing that maybe it could be Ewald who awakens Hadley and starts thinking about sound in a similar fashion to what was covered in the automaton ear, as we were saying before, and says, quote, Of course it's possible that man will someday be able to recover either by electricity or by some more subtle means the undying interstellar reverberations of everything that has occurred on Earth. And he also gives us some musings of what it would be like if photography existed in the ancient times, so if we could get pictures of yeah. these famous people instead of paintings but he doesn't just muse about it he seems to feel really bad about it mm -hmm. like, like it's not a thing and somehow this makes the inventions not as valid as they should be yeah right because he needs to capture the golden ost. age <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you all arrives in menlo park before edison expects him and he says he must get back to new york city that night Ewald himself is a handsome lord in his late 20s but edison notices he's quite depressed about something and Ewald says he's a love and proceeds to give Edison the backstory. By chance, he met Alicia Clary on a train, an incredibly beautiful woman, 
but was spurned by her ex-fiancé and became a theater singer to support herself. She didn't love her ex-fiancé, only his money, and seems only concerned with the accumulation of wealth. She considers singing a low profession and wasn't concerned about the scandal of the broken marriage, but only the money she lost because of it. Ewald's totally disgusted by her attitude, but falls in love with her anyway due to her physical beauty, admitting it's not rational at all, but goes on to say she's shallow and boring, but her beauty is beyond words, like that of a goddess. Alicia's not wicked, but mediocre and dull, and Ewald exclaims, quote, Ah, who will deliver the soul out of this body for me? And it looks like he's come to the right place. Ewald goes on about how vapid Alicia is, she's bored by travel and art, and sees herself in the statue of a goddess in a museum. Which later turns out to sort of be a real thing. Yeah. I though know, I, I think was, I thought that at first, too. I thought that was just her seeing like herself in that and being vain. But yeah. later it seems like they're almost saying it's actually a real thing. I think Edison was pulling her leg there, but... I guess so, yeah. I guess we'll see when we get to that point. I don't know. Yeah, because <laughs> he talks to Ewald about it like it's a real thing, too. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. The Venus statue one display. In the Louvre, I think, right? At the Louvre, yeah. 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 Venus yeah. victorious. Right. Yeah. And Ewald concludes out of all this saying he doesn't want to live anymore. And it seems to me like Alicia is a typical immature 20-year-old. And if Ewald wanted somebody who could appreciate the fine things in life, especially his own genius, then he should probably just date somebody his own age. But since he has an obviously huge opinion of itself, and it really feels like it's an incredibly transparent standing for Vieira's own views about women and relationships. Ewald says he can never love again. He wants only Alicia. And Edison says he'll take the soul out of her body for him, to which Ewald accepts. Edison says he's going to have her ready within 21 days. And at this point, Alicia's currently at the opera, and Edison contacts one of his employees in New York to retrieve her. He tells Ewald to brace for the uncomfortable situation and activates a secret mechanism to which Hadley arises. Edison blows up a picture of Alicia and tells Hadley it will be the form she will assume, to which Hadley says she's lovely and returns back to her secret enclosure. Edison reveals to Ewald that she's an artificial life form and shows Ewald the severed arm that he had lying around earlier, which feels warm and lifelike. Edison says it's synthetic, created with the use of the sun, and he calls the creation an android. Android. Yeah. <laughs> android. Which I think is like the Greek naiad or dryad, but with the andro prefix meaning like a human nymph, you know, a nymph of humankind rather than a nymph yeah. of the sea or nymph of the forest. I'm not totally convinced by the dryad thing, but it could be. It could yeah. be, yeah. That's my guess at the origins of the word. But it does appear to be the first use of the word android in fiction. Which is fascinating. Yeah, really. yeah. I mean, it doesn't predate the concept of a robot, but it predates the word, certainly. Right, and yeah, robot has a much clearer lineage as far as the word goes, where it's basically the Slavic verb to work in almost every Slavic language. Yeah, and that makes sense, because the idea of a robot is supposed to be a worker, whereas an android is something that resembles a human being as almost exactly as possible. Right. Right. So, and that's pretty much what we've been talking about this entire episode, and we're getting to this point, and the Hadali android is certainly the closest to a human being that we're going to see. Absolutely, today. yeah. I think that Hadali is... Vivier's genius stroke. I think that she is awesome and she is the one thing that makes this book bearable, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's a great character, which we'll see more of in a bit. Um, but the severed hand that Edison has lying around responds in kind to Ewald's handshake. And Ewald tells Edison that he was planning on committing suicide that night. Yeah, it's very dramatic. And yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> and you can I'm also almost imagine Viers pulling this kind of stunt after some ridiculously manic performance in a cafe that he might get some jeering laughs from from the crowd. Then yeah. going or into some some, some woman ran away from him. Yeah, because right. He exactly. Was like his antics were unbearable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Edison tells him that he's going to replicate every physical feature of Alicia, but with a kind soul worthy of her beauty. To which you all are skeptical that it won't behave like a machine, but Edison assures him that'll be more realistic than the real thing. So you all accepts 
Alicia's going to have to sit through multiple sitting sessions to emulate her features, gestures, and mannerisms, and she'll be eventually transported back to England in a coffin. Vier tells us that the name Hadali, Hadali, means ideal in Iranian, but I wasn't able to verify this with Google Translate. Yeah, I couldn't find the origin of the word either. That was something that really interested me, but... Yeah, yeah, the closest I got was kind of a jumble of the syllables all mixed up, so I don't know how much Persian <laughs> Vier knew, or if he was just winging yeah, it here. I don't think he knew any. Yeah. <laughs> but Edison goes into detail about her voice, which are two phonographs of gold, her skeletal systems, iron joints, oil with rose oil, and her diet is longes of zinc pills and potassium dichromate, sometimes peroxide of lead, though. She carries a dagger for her defense and has a cylinder of gestures. In a rather odd turn, it's revealed that she's stored over an Algonquin burial ground, which I thought was just totally out of the blue, considering it's like yeah. an offhand reference. It never comes up again. Yeah, right. It's, there's a few <laughs> things in like that in this book, for yeah. sure. The two descend to her underground lair, which is an elaborate room in Syrian style, which has Edison's electric lighting system, of course, artificial birds, a large piano, which she says it's the work of God. And to her, God must be Edison. Birdsong is played through an elaborate phonograph telegraph system, and Ewald's already impressed by Huddley in her neutral state, and he wants to know why Edison created her, and Edison asks her to leave so they can talk in private. So Edison goes to think back and recollect the time he spent in Louisiana as a young man with his friend Edward Anderson. This is a hilarious story. Yeah. <laughs> so Anderson goes out to the opera, he gets drunk, and meets his woman Evelyn Habal, who flirts with him all night, and he goes home with her. She seduces him, and he tries to make up some story to convince his wife, and his wife sees right through it and tells him to be better with his story so his children aren't humiliated with the affair. Anderson basically lives with Evelyn for a while, where she ruins him after three years and leaves, and he eventually commits suicide. And this kind of relationship is compared with opium abuse. And Edison says he intends to study seduction and these disastrous effects, and really starts railing against women there, comparing them to sirens, with a direct yeah. comparison of Evelyn to Eve. And it's really the most misogynistic section of the book. Edison says is these seductresses should be killed like vampires or vipers and <laughs> so yeah there's this elephant in the room the misogyny in this book is really extreme yeah and often i think misogyny is a word that's misused like it's used to apply to things that are in fact maybe not good but much lighter than misogyny but i think there is actual misogyny in this book quite a bit yeah i normally try to quote something that's good and that's awesome but actually, the one quote that I excerpted from this book was from towards the end of this book three, where he really goes into this story of Anderson. He says, No doubt in every man there slumber ugly desires, rising from the fumes of flesh and blood, and terrible when unleashed. Certainly, since my friend Edward Anderson succumbed, the germs must have been in his heart. As in limbo, him I neither excuse nor... Judge, but I declare her guilty above all of a capital crime, that pestilent creature whose function it was to unleash knowingly, deliberately, the hundred-headed hydra within him. She was in no way comparable, I think, to Eve, that simple-minded Eve, whose love it was fatal, no doubt, but still love dragged her toward the temptation that she thought would raise her companion in paradise to the station of a god. This was a deliberate assailant, avid with a secret and instinctive lust to drag down, almost in spite of herself, to the most sordid spheres of instinct, into the most abject darkness of the spirit. The soul of a man from whom she wanted nothing except one day to be able to contemplate with idiot satisfaction his destruction, his despair. And it goes on. And that whole part actually is a massive tirade that goes on for several paragraphs. Yes, yeah, it, it goes on for and, quite a while. 
Yeah, and it's really extreme. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> this is the part where I think we both realized that the title refers to the biblical Eve because Vier really beats you over the head with it for quite a few pages here. And yeah. <laughs> it's also where I realized that it's not a coincidence that everybody's name pretty much in the novel begins with an E. You know, yeah, he, he's not super subtle that. about it. But it, right. Eve, he really has some resentment against her even though he says she's not intentionally malicious he doesn't really talk about her in a positive light no no he says that eve eve was not intentionally malicious but this person this specific dragger down this evil in was malicious even if she wasn't conscious of it necessarily right again i think it's this kind of idealization of the ancient past where it's like Yes, Eve is to blame, but she's somehow more pure than these modern women right. and their their ways. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. and you know, and again it ties into this Alicia Clary, right? Why doesn't Ewald just move on? Like why doesn't he just find somebody else who's right. more Date somebody's own intellectually age. <laughs> congruent? Yeah. yeah. Meet like, somebody who enjoys the opera. You know, they were huge spectacles, you know, I'm sure you could find somebody. Dashing yeah. English Lord? Come on. Yeah. But he's so single-minded in this thing, and it's so weird. Yeah. You're so obsessed with the way she looks, and yet you find her repugnant? Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. know. I don't know. It's just... <laughs> it's really... <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. this other story, right? Evelyn and Edward Anderson, what they get up to, yes. Anderson kills himself. So no doubt when Lord Ewald says to Edison that he wants to commit suicide. Edison has a kind of a flashback to that moment and feels like right. he can't let this friend of his do the same thing. He feels like he has a moral imperative to stop it almost. Right, right. And that's what he tells him almost throughout the entire novel when it comes up. But after this tirade that Edison goes on, he attempts to track down Habal herself, but it turns out she's dead too. So here's where Edison pulls a cord and out comes Habal an illusion projected via film onto a neutral android form. And this is where Edison starts to break down the physical anatomy of the android itself, which consists of the soul that he describes as systems of the interior, the plastic mediator, which sounds something like tendons, flesh, which he refers to as the muscles, and the outer epidermis, which he's referring to as the skin. On the spine, he says that intricate code recorded on metal discs dictate the movement, and that pre-recorded speech on phonograph tapes seven hours each compose her vocabulary bank. A cylinder codes all of her gestures and expressions, and some kind of fluid and galvanoplastics are what's holding it all together. Her responses and personality are totally dependent on Ewald's. She has no will of her own, and another element to the misogynistic angle of the novel is that the ideal woman is completely subservient to man's desires in every way. Yeah, and she only even only has a certain number of program gestures, right. and he says, like, well, who would want a woman that exactly. moves <laughs> un unsavorily? Yeah. Like... <laughs> he said, gesturing too much is very inappropriate for a proper woman. very inappropriate like for that. a woman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here, you all's a bit hesitant, but Edison quickly convinces him to get back on board and describes her feet which are of quicksilver and platinum, controlled by an electromagnet, and an amethyst ring on her right hand is used for issuing commands. Crystal ball joints form the method of locomotion, and the whole process generates heat, which fills the body cavity with water vapor. He presents Hadali in a neutral appearance form, and she says she wants to do acts of charity for Mrs. Anderson. She keeps her face veiled, as Edison says, he doesn't want to leave negative impressions on Ewald of the process and says that Alicia must pose nude for an artist who will just copy her form and doesn't glorify or idealize it. Adali will be watching and will use photo sculpture, which Edison has apparently perfected to assume her physical form. Edison will achieve this by knocking Alicia out with some kind of anesthetic gas. Yeah, they're going to drug her. Yeah. They're going to invite her over <laughs> under some weird pretense of being part of a play. Yeah. Or a series of plays and knock her out with a drug. Yeah. And then take records of her mouth and various other yeah. measurements. Yeah, they're gonna sculpt her teeth and tongue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really bad. 
<laughs> but he tells you all that it's very important that Hadali must be destroyed when he dies because she is eternal otherwise and will have no purpose divorced from him. Hadali herself enjoys stargazing with Edison's sensitive astronomical equipment, specifically looking at dying stars. And Edison here discusses a what's called radiant state of matter, a key to Hadali's functioning which is a reference to William Crook's work, who was a chemist. And this idea of a radiant state of matter was a proposed fourth state of matter that was an idea later discredited, but briefly popular during the time that this novel was written. Hadali speaks like a Stoic philosopher in a way, not like data from Star Trek or a character from The Mummy, but yeah. <laughs> speaking in Good. these odd, yeah. unique metaphors and... The way she speaks and views the world is very much at odds with Edison saying that she's yeah in response only to man's commands. And Ewald actually worries a lot whether he'll be able to even understand her. Right. Yeah. She, in this state, is this fascinating character that just doesn't understand quite her place in the world, but does at the same time and enjoys looking at the dying universe through, I guess, Edison's high-tech gear at the time. You know, he's got the best telescopes. He's got the best observatory stuff. So Hadali has full advantage of this fact, and she imports it all in this philosophical construct. And she's far, far more sophisticated mentally than Edison makes her out to be. So I thought that was a very interesting dichotomy here. Very eerie. And it's very suggestive that there's more going on here than what Edison surmises and what he thinks. Yeah. And even if that might not actually be the case, it's actually probably the most interesting implication of the book. Yeah, absolutely. Because it makes Hadali seem independent of the things that Edison is saying, which are generally very mechanistic, very oriented towards the fact that this is a facsimile Mm -hmm. of some kind but the way Hadali acts and the way she says things and the way she actually affects Ewald when they're actually together points to something else completely yeah yeah I mean Edison almost describes her like you describe a modern advertising algorithm you know on Amazon or whatever tailoring <laughs> advertisements to what you're interested in or what you've done that day whereas yeah. when we get to see Hadali's personality through her own word she's like this lost hyper intelligent being that enjoys <laughs> looking at the universe fading out it's it's very otherworldly it's very odd because i feel almost as though uh, i'm not sure how much of this va was conscious of like i kind of feel as though i mean obviously he wrote hadali to be something special right but given how he is described as somebody who didn't really like science and progress and at the same time, he seems to have spent so much time and effort to describe how the automaton was made right. and how it functions. But then on top of all that, he makes her something more than the sum of her parts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So around this time, Alicia comes for her sittings. She doesn't know who Edison is and gets annoyed at Ewald for not properly she introducing them. She thinks he's them. some like, master of the theater or <laughs> yeah, something like right. that. <laughs> Yeah. So the three of them are discussing opera, and Alicia seems totally disinterested. And she talks about how gunshots in opera are noise and not art. <laughs> yeah. It's not real art. Yeah. <laughs> it's just <Yeah>. noise. <laughs> <laughs> Which is an interesting thing that'll come up in the 20th century of avant garde oh, yeah. music, of yeah. actual noise being introduced, but that's a bit later. Edison tells her she's going to be seen by the great artist Annie Sawana. And I thought here, Edison was really pulling her leg, saying that all the fashionable ladies get their sculptures made. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I, I, I thought they were totally bullshitting with her to get her to go along with posing for sculpture. And when she leaves the room, you all use the opportunity to complain more about how terrible she is. So during all this time, I'm sorry, I just want to point out, all Alicia has really potentially done is be slightly annoying. Yeah. She's immature and doesn't care about fine art, and those yeah, are her great sins. I mean, if, yeah, if you think that that earns somebody being, like, 
drugged against their will and stuff like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so after Alicia completes her sittings and Edison has all the data he needs to construct Hotele in facsimile of Alicia, Edison locks himself in Menlo Park and no longer appears in the public. Yeah, and there's some Jules Vernish satire bits coming from this. Yeah. Because apparently everybody is really attuned to what Thomas Edison is doing. Right. And everybody's speculating that he might have died and just like nobody notices it. And he has this mysterious box shipped to Menlo Park, which is opened up by some curious shipping workers. And they're just totally surprised that the only thing in it is women's clothing. <laughs> yeah, it's actually suggested that they're like wagon robbers or something like yeah. that. Like they actually yeah. <laughs> are out to steal from them. Yeah. But they don't really get the kind of things that they want. Like it's a bunch of ladies' garments. Mm -hmm. So they're very uh, nonplussed. After the construction has finished, Ewald returns to see Edison. And as he comes up, he sees Alicia's just hanging out with him. And he's a little confused by this. And Edison tells him that Hadali's almost done. And Alicia and you all go out to talk privately. And here, Alicia's incredibly tender and compassionate and receptive to his feelings. And this causes you all to fall back in love with her. And he's going to approach Edison and just tell him to call off the whole thing. That it was a silly thing, that he was being irrational and dramatic. But then Alicia tells him that she's not Alicia at all. That she is Hadali. It's Hadali! <laughs> And you all just completely horrified at the exact likeness at everything. But not even the likeness, but the emotional resonance of yeah. the things that she said and yeah. did. It was just so much more profound. She presents a long monologue on human nature, saying it's only a dream, but begs him not to wake up from it. And that her personality is completely changeable based on his whim. And while he's having second thoughts... She's deeply distraught and sad by this, and she gives a very emotional speech, which he then ultimately accepts her. Yeah. It's like the climax of the whole book, and it's kind of like really, really sad, because you know even the author of the book can't quite even approximate what she's saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know. That, to me, was really sad. Yeah. Really, really sad. Yeah, it's a really good scene. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's probably my favorite part of the whole book. Yeah, honestly, it's one of the earliest scenes that we see of that nature of like uh, Rachel from Blade Runner type character. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, something developing a sense of sentience and personality, and it was exactly like that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think about, it, but that's that's a really good comparison. Right. Yeah. And again, this is 1886, so it's it's quite early for this, especially when a lot of other automatons we've seen in fiction to this point haven't really been self-aware in the sense that they have a unique personality. I mean, some of them might behave like people on a superficial level or something like that, but this is the first time we're really seeing feelings in an automaton. So after Ewald accepts her as his bride-to-be, I guess, Edison disconnects her and then puts her in her coffin for the overseas voyage. Yeah. And he disconnects her from all the, like, the basic ley lines, I guess, of the place where she's at. Like, the underground place that presumably has a lot of wiring and things that are connected together. Right. Like, there's there's a lot of, we haven't mentioned this yet, but there's a lot of, like, to me, even though we did Frankenstein and we did maybe a couple of other examples of uh, scientists who have, like, laboratories and stuff... This is a first example of what I would term a futuristic laboratory integrated setting where there's a scientist who's basically surrounded by mechanical conveniences and different things that are part of the work that he's doing, but that are all linked together. Right. And everything that he's doing is linked together. He can communicate very easily between his offices in New York and New Jersey. Like, he has automatic servants willing to do his bidding he has phonographs and intercoms at his disposal he can even show things like illusory almost he has all these powers at his disposal at the touch of a button right we have never seen that before and it's interesting that it does reflect on edison the man 
I think that the most important thing that Edison did with his career, while he's most known for the lighting and the phonograph and these other very important milestones, is the establishment and development of the modern research laboratory. Yeah. I think he was really the first to establish a laboratory enterprise business where it is managed from the top down. And a couple decades later, you'd see theories of scientific management and things like that. But Edison's initial laboratories basically served as the blueprint for all modern R&D laboratories from Bell Labs to Xerox Park to everything in modern Silicon Valley, really. So even though VA seems to be down on science, like the uh, introduction points that out very flagrantly, I don't know. We don't know for sure. I question it a little bit just because it seems that there's so much attention paid to the mechanics of things that I have to wonder whether he was really as down on it as all that. Yeah. I can't help but think if he was really that against it, would he spend that much time trying to describe it and obviously having read about it and thought about it? Up He's to certainly that very interested in it. That's for yeah. sure. Like more than anybody else. I, I gotta say, like this was a hard book for me to get through because books two, four, and five were all pretty much nothing but conversation about right. how things work. Yeah. Like yeah. that's half the book. Yeah. So right this there. book, as we said, is longer than everything else we've read for this episode combined. It's not super, super long, but it's about 220 pages. And I would say 90% of that is conversation between Edison and Ewald. Very little real-world action happens in the novel. Yeah. Uh, book six was the last book when it started, and Alicia was finally there. I'm like, all right, now stuff's finally <laughs> yeah. happening, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't know. There were certain aspects of this that I enjoyed. Obviously, reading a bit about VA and knowing what kind of person he seems to have been, like, that is a potential... I'm not going to say downside, but it's a potential, like, barrier between you and the reader and getting into the book because you know that that's the kind of person he is. Right. And that comes through in the book. Yeah. But when things actually happen, it's good. And when Hadali shows herself to be a creature in her own right, it's good. But there's just, yeah, there's so much just talking and nothing happening. <laughs> and yeah. So much, this is how this would work. And again, to me, that kind of downplays what Adam said about VA. Like, surely he was more interested in science than all that. Because yeah. he does go into it a lot. and, and Quite in depth, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And a lot of the things he describes, it seems to me like he thought about it. Like, the, the whole idea of the phonographs being used to not only program Hadali, as in... These are her actual programming on phonographic discs. So they're not sound. Like, they're not meant to be used as sound. It's actual, somehow, logic programming. The logic aspect. But the speech aspect is a separate thing. Now, we have voice synthesizers now that use sampled human speech. And how a person actually does that is they sit down and they record hours and hours of stuff. Right, And they have all these different things that they have to say. And they can sit there for hours and hours. And in the end, we're able to compile the phonemes of what they say into actual synthesized speech. And it doesn't sound perfectly human, but it's close enough that it's not displeasurable to listen to. Yeah. And I have that kind of software on my computer right now that does that. And it's based on the exact same principle that VA is describing, mm -hmm. except it's not using phonographs, which is way more efficient, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, it's, it's, I mean, obviously there was no digital audio at that time. No. So I, he's basically describing how a modern hard drive functions, though, where you have a series of platters that contain data and a needle, depending on what you want to call up, rotates between all of them, goes down to the point you need. Spins it for yeah. however long you need it to read it for, and then it goes to the next data bit you need. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine a phonograph being fast enough to actually yeah. work through all those things. <laughs> yeah. but. No, it obviously wouldn't be, but it's just interesting that the basic 
mathematical and engineering concepts behind what he's describing are the exact same way that are the principles of modern data retrieval. Yeah, it is actually really interesting. And it makes me think that, again, did you really hate science that much? I don't know. Like, that's just what yeah. was said about him. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's not quite that. Like, maybe that's not quite right. But yeah. it's hard to tell with, I mean, he's not necessarily an obscure author. He was popular at the time, but there doesn't seem to be a substantial amount of biographical attention devoted to him due to the fact that he really only has two major works, this and Axel. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think he would have the same kind of critical attention as some of the other people we've looked at, like Werner Wells, where they have a huge body no. of work and enduring no, no, influence over not. time, whereas you know, VA's influence seems to Somebody really... like H.G. Wells is like a celebrity writer. He never stopped saying stuff. Yeah, exactly. And writing it down. Yep. Whereas this guy actually, and it's mentioned several times, he disappeared for like long stretches of time, and nobody actually knows where he was or how he was surviving right. or where he was making yeah. money or anything. So, I think the end, VA leaves us on a down note, which is a strength of the novel, I thought. So after Hadali is disconnected, She's packed up in her coffin, and Edison and you all drink some sherry, what else, to toast to the impossible. Edison ends the tale of Mrs. Anderson, and he uses mesmerism and human magnetism to hypnotize her and cure her of depression using the same kind of rings that Hadali has. And now she's living as Sawana. After he sets up their children with financial help, the name and identity of Sawana come to her in a dream. And Sawana herself was a major force in Edison constructing Hadali, especially with regards to importing Alicia's physical features. After the ship departs from England, Edison receives word a few weeks later that Ewald's ship sunk. Fire broke out on board, and when Ewald tries to rush into the flames to get Hadali's coffin, he's dragged out by the workmen and unable to retrieve her. Alicia herself was killed when her lifeboat capsizes. And Ewald telegraphs Edison, saying, My friend, only the loss of Hadali leaves me inconsolable. I grieve only for that shade. And Edison is left distraught, shivering in the cold. So, the ending does leave us on a real down note, and again, the misogynistic tone comes through where Ewald doesn't seem to care at all that Alicia was killed and probably drowned a horrible death in the freezing ocean. He's only concern is with the loss of Hadali, a technically non-living creature that presumably Edison could just whip up another one in But he probably time. couldn't. Well, I don't know. Could he? He had all the data that he retrieved from Alicia. Do you think he threw that out? Or do you think I he still know. has that, that stuff? I don't know. I mean, he does actually talk about, one thing that he actually does talk about, which is interesting to discuss, is he talks about the potential future of manufactured automata. So he talks about the idea that maybe in the future, factories will churn out creatures like Hadali and they will be mass produced and they will be available to people, uh, presumably higher class people with the right amount of money yeah, right. to spend <laughs> on sex slaves or whatever. Yeah. Right? <laughs> the sexual aspect is not gone into that much, but there's definitely hints that Dolly is perfectly capable. Yeah. Like, there's definitely more more hints to that than the other way. Right, right. Again, like, it's not gone into that much. We both talked before about, like, how the French works seem to be a bit more open about sexuality and stuff. This is maybe not quite as much so as you would expect from contemporary French works. No. It's still perhaps not quite as closed off about that stuff as contemporary english works but then again at the same time it makes you wonder if that's more of a reflection not necessarily of the culture and censors but rather no, but VA, va himself, himself. Yeah, if yeah. he was more yeah. interested in just kind of setting out this venom against womankind as a whole yeah. rather than going into any kind of no, sexuality definitely. which somebody like i don't know a stendhal or somebody <laughs> like that would would really get into yeah but the hints, I think, are there that not only is she anatomically correct, but she's capable of 
those things. Well, yeah, I mean, she's intended like, to be I, Ewald's bride, and you know, you would think that, right? You know, that would go along with. Yeah, there's a, he says that she could be a woman that a man could love without shame. Now, yeah. I don't really <laughs> know exactly what that means, right? <laughs> but I can kind of guess at what it might mean, but I just I don't know for sure. Right? Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, the suggestion's definitely there, right? And he does go into the mass production possibilities. I think that it's still really far away from that. I mean, the whole idea that Hadali is still kind of unique. I didn't really get the feeling that it would be so easy to just create another one. Yeah, but it seems within the realm of possibility. Yeah. He has, I guess, prior work in Sawana, and I guess in yeah. constructing Hadali, he would take his knowledge gained from there. If the fictional Edison is anything like the real world Edison, Edison was a meticulous note taker and documenter. The yeah. Edison papers have been published in physical form and there is just so and much. It is like 15 or 16 and... volumes that are 2000 pages long each. Uh, it's just a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> it would be a lot to take in at yeah. any time. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, we we don't really know how much VA knew about Edison. I mean, and at this point, it was kind of Edison's early to mid career. This is 1886, right? So Edison died, I think, in the 30s sometime, and he was involved in stuff for his entire career, even if his later ventures weren't as initially groundbreaking or successful. Like his concrete furniture didn't really go anywhere, or his mining ventures were a bust. Uh, but I don't really know anything about that stuff. Yeah, he, he was a person who was involved in every single emerging technology, exploring possibilities, even if they didn't yeah, I mean, that go makes anywhere. Sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean he had yeah. the, the business wealth and the reach through his laboratory, but he did other pioneering developments in like motion pictures and things like that. The right. earliest surviving Frankenstein was his production. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Other things like that where, you know, you might not not necessarily associate them with the, the lighting and the phonograph that he was known for from this era but yeah he was working his entire life pretty much yeah i mean it, it makes you wonder like if the real edison had known about all this stuff that was being written that kind of used his name what would he have said what would he have done it, it almost makes me think of like poe uh not poe um herschel yeah herschel and all the people coming up to him and being like hey man right what about all that stuff like would people be coming to Edison and going, hey, what about that automaton? Yeah, like, right. <laughs> did you, uh, how did that go? Can you tell us about that? And him getting yeah. all pissed off about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think copyright laws and that kind of financial lawsuit was far less easy to enforce and far less strict oh, back yeah. then. As Again, we'll talk about more in the Edison aid episode but edison's conquests of mars not only uses thomas edison as a main character but yeah, i mean it makes him look pretty good but yeah uh, but it's still. it's also an unauthorized sequel to <laughs> wells's war of the worlds which is how it was billed and today if you tried to do that my novels an unofficial sequel to pet cemetery <laughs> i would get sued pretty quickly yeah but probably back then laws were a lot more flexible and i guess and it's funny too because like edison's conquest of mars even seems to be like antithetical to wells like yeah. in how he oh, thought yeah about absolutely things. yeah <laughs> yeah you know like wells was really interested in the idea of comparing english colonialism to like a potential colonialism of another species yeah and trying to be like well, what if we were, what if some species attempt, what if they attempted to colonize us? Mm -hmm. Whereas Edison's conquest of Mars is like, no, human triumph and strength. Let's, let's beat these Martians and colonize them and, and destroy them. And then we can have a presence on Mars. We can put up the flag, man. It'll be yeah. awesome. Yeah. Not just human, but American in particular, which is you know, a common theme we're going to see throughout all these stories that are really derived from the model that Steam Man of the Prairies established, because it has a lot of those same ideas. But it's interesting that Tomorrow's Eve is sometimes considered an Edison aid because it really does not share 
any similarities with the rest of the genre at all, no. aside from the yeah, fact that it has yeah. Thomas Edison as the main character. But he could easily be somebody else entirely. He could be. And the ending is very downbeat. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's very downbeat. It's very... I don't know. Like, it's this weird dichotomy in that I don't... I feel like VA was very... Like, the way he's described... He seems like a very annoying person and not, yeah. <laughs> not somebody that you really want to hang out with. No. But at the same time, when you read that ending, it's almost like he's transcended that a little bit because he has a poetic soul, maybe. But he's just gone a little bit beyond what you think about the VA character. And that, like, Hadali is way more than what she seems to be. Yeah. She and Ewald might have had a future. But it probably would have gone bad somehow. So in the end, it's this kind of inescapable fate where there was a fire that happened and Hadali has died before she could even get to England and get to experience this beautiful life that she envisioned and that was just beginning. And it was just a hint of something on the horizon, something beautiful and something great. But at the same time, it's like, well, if she only had Ewald's will to fall back on, could she have really developed as an individual or not? Right. We don't know any of those things. And it's just the kind of thing that, like, again, we see now or in recent times, like, obviously the most famous example would be Data from Star Trek, where he's constantly trying to sort of approximate humanity and obviously i mean the whole idea of star trek is that the future is supposed to be uber enlightened where the people that you live with and the people that you work with will support you in all your things like data wants to be more human fine all his fellow officers and people on the ship will support him in any acting things that he wants to do or any things that he wants to do to be more human. You can even have an episode where he gets together with a woman and they live together for a while to see how that works out. Hadali doesn't have that kind of chance. It's just, it's, to me, it's just a really sad thing because yeah. it feels like VA almost touched on it a little bit. And like that was almost understood. And even though there's so much time spent on the uncanniness and there's so much time spent on the fact that Hadali might not be a human being and your summary pretty much captured everything that needed to be captured but Ewald does not like he's not convinced that easily he's very on the fence about all this and yeah for, a, for many many points. many, yeah. many times he yeah. wants to call the whole thing off yeah and even when he like talks to Edison and asks him all these questions he almost seems like hysterical at times, the way he describes it. Like he's almost, he's like talking weirdly. He's sounding like desperate almost. Like, yeah. Like this whole idea is a problem. <laughs> Edison is being very calm and didactic. Like he's presenting it as though it's a scholarly lecture. Right. And at times he's somewhat surprised at you all's questions that, you know, how could you even think of this not working? Of course it's going to be yeah. perfect. And Well, because they go over the same ground, like, often, over yeah. and over again, yeah. right? Yeah. And so uh, you can sort of imagine Edison being impatient with it, and you can kind of imagine, like, every time Edison is impatient with it, and Ewald is like, he asks him a question, and his voice is, like, raised, and everything is slightly off. Like, mm -hmm. the questions that he's asking are very important questions and, and again like there's this whole idea that women are nothing but objects yeah and that basically a woman is she can be beautiful she can be perfect but ultimately if she has her own will and her own her own way of being that actually does not add to her positive traits it's not quite desirable and hadali is like in a way, she's a slave to the whim of others, but she is also extremely powerful. Yep. And she's, uh, she has something about her where, like, the way Edison describes it, yeah, she has all these rings that are their different control points, right? And they're different ways of 
getting to different parts of her being, and she also has this defense mechanism that can protect her from unwanted advances and various other unwanted things, and this defense mechanism is perfect, and no mere human being can withstand against it. <laughs> like, it's so profound and so mighty, and Ewald is really shaken by this. Like, his whole being is kind of like, this is almost too much for me to handle. Right. <laughs> uh, it's really good. It, like, it's really good, and that's actually during that entire books two, four, and five, <laughs> like half this book, that was kind of what kept it interesting for me, was the interactions between them in that sense. B.A. did go a lot into describing how the joints worked and how the mechanisms worked, and more so than any other author By far. that we've yeah. encountered. And yeah. To me, that's like, maybe the introduction is not Maybe that's not quite accurate. Like, it seems to me like he had more of an interest in science than outright dismissal and denial. Yeah. Some of the science you know. does feel more poetic. You know, the joints being lubricated with Roy's oil and the lungs being oh, yeah. gold phonographs and all that. But a lot of it does bear resemblance to how we would conceive of a modern humanoid robot with how the systems function. Some of it doesn't, but some thought was put into this. It's not just all poetry and fantasy and magic like we might see in an earlier story. Or even many later stories. Right, that's true too. Yeah, and there was a lot put into it, and there was a lot that seemed like, yes, reaching, but smart reaching, you yeah, know? Like, exactly. I don't know. It makes VA seem like an interesting character because he seems contradictory in many ways. Yeah. I've said many times that it's very poetic the way he puts things. He's very good with imagery and poetry and that kind of thing. I just think where he bogs down is the actual plotting and pacing of the novel as well as <laughs> some of the underlying themes. Yeah, this novel was hard for me to get through because three of the six books were the same thing, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. and it really... Book three was the most misogynistic one, where it went into the story of Edward Anderson and Evelyn. To me, that was just like, I didn't understand why Edward Anderson wasn't blamed. Like, Yeah, he left his wife to cheat on somebody at the opera, you know? Uh, come on. <laughs> right. Like, it was all her fault. Yeah. <laughs> and to me, that's like, that doesn't make sense. I, no. I think to most modern readers, that probably wouldn't make sense. No. Not that everybody nowadays is so much more intelligent, because, like, that's obviously not true. But I just don't. All this condemnation of womankind for being responsible for the temptation of otherwise good men. Yeah. Like, I, I just don't. I don't buy it. I just don't uh, buy it. Even, even for the think. time, it has a very nasty undercurrent. Yeah. Of misogyny and in a lot of the adventure stories we're gonna read there's almost no women at all and right and but that's fine like that's that's almost like we don't know how to write women so we just won't right like that in in a way is better yeah because that's like kind of like okay we're just gonna skirt the issue entirely right but this is like a whole diatribe against women in general and it feels very uncomfortable at times and it makes it even more frustrating because VA is clearly talented with words. It's just how he chooses to apply them sometimes. It, uh, yeah, it may be based on his own personal experience. And that, that really comes through. I mean, you all and Edison are both different sides of a self-insert of VA. I mean, they express sentiments that are very similar to how he conducted himself in life with these wild outbursts of his own genius, but then followed by moments of incredible depressiveness and yeah. it alternates back and forth between the two of them throughout the entire novel of you all wanting to commit suicide and then edison's friend anderson commits suicide and then hadawi drowns i guess it sinks to the bottom of the ocean in a coffin with her own name on it at the end yeah. and who knows what you all does after the course of the novel yeah so definitely a candle of sadness for Hadali because yeah. <laughs> like she almost was the creation that transcended VA 
and went beyond what maybe he could have even envisioned. Mm -hmm. He actually really succeeded in conveying the idea that she was something special and that went beyond what the conception of her was supposed to be. And that definitely, definitely the part in Book Six where Ewald kind of, he believed that he was with Alicia and she was acting like strange and she was acting more emotional than normal yeah. and more like receptive than normal and more like and then realizing that it was Hadali the entire time and i saw that coming i knew that was I yeah knew it that was, was coming very obvious but yeah i mean i can't remember when it was i think at some point addison tried to listen in because he had some microphones and he tried to like he tried to listen in and he couldn't in the end but he wanted to listen to their intimate conversation and I just kind of felt, oh, I, I feel like I know what's going to happen here. I think that this is not the real Alicia. And sure enough, it wasn't. Um, like it really, really brought home this sense of this creature that was so unique and so special. And even early on, before she adopted the form of Alicia, Edison was talking to her. And this was in like book one, I think, even. And Edison was talking to her and she's like, Oh, so this is the form I must assume and she's kind of like sad about she's kind of like a little bit childishly oh no is this really what I want to do yeah and and she actually seemed to have personality yeah and it's just amazing that VA who seems to be so one-sided like in his ideas about women and his like he still seemed to almost touch something special and he still seemed to imbue this woman who was really an artificial creation with a personality of her own that was not Alicia's personality and was not just this is what Lord Ewald wants. Right. Like, and it's such a bizarre a personality more... too. And yeah. I think those scenes with her just gazing off and reflecting in her own thoughts like Edison was doing are probably the best parts of the novel. Yeah. Those were the best things of the whole book. Yeah. And they really did actually convey the poetic power that VA could actually have. And you just kind of help, can't help but think if you just got over this misogyny a little bit, like it would be so good. Yeah. It would be so good. And he just doesn't quite manage it, but no, he's so not close. At all. <laughs> not at all. It's so close. There's a lot of flaws in this novel that make themselves very apparent from the get go, but I think it is worth looking at from more than a historical standpoint. I mean, Steam Man obviously has its place in history as far as its popularity and what it influenced later down the line for pulps and sci-fi adjacent pulps and all, but this really has some merit to it aside from the historical standpoint, even though it is a greatly flawed work at its core. Yeah, it does have more emotional connection than Steam Man has. Yeah, Steam Man has no so, emotional connection. At right, all. it has no emotional feeling or connection at all. This is really striving for a lot of that. It's right. striving for a lot of what Steam Man does not strive for. It doesn't achieve all of it because I really feel like VA is saying that we we should relate to Anderson and all that, and it's just like it's not really happening. But he still manages to, yeah, like he still manages to convey that connection and make us feel that Hadali is more than what Edison even says that she is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the two novels couldn't be further apart as far as what they're concerned with. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Steam Man is maybe a third the length, but encompasses so much more real world action than happens in this book. <laughs> yeah. <know? laughs> That is definitely a frustration with Tomorrow's Eve is that not a lot happens for like a great portion of the book. And when it does happen, it's a little bit like you have to feel weird about it and question it. So there's one thing yeah. that we didn't mention that they drug Alicia and they're going to like take all of these measurements of her and stuff like that. So Edison calls in all these famous people who are like really good at measuring stuff. <laughs> and one of them is a dentist who's known for raping his yeah. patients. Yeah, it's just such an offhand comment out of the blue, and it's like, wait, what? Yeah, it's just like really, he's known for his fantastic bridge work, easy disposition, and the innocent 
habit of raping his patients. Yeah, it was a, what? Just, yeah, <laughs> completely out of nowhere. Yeah, and it's like, all right, so if you know that, why would you hire this guy? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I don't know. It, it's just so... There's a couple other weird offhand lines, too. Oh, yeah. A part towards the end when you all and Edison are celebrating, you all gives Edison his pistol, and Edison just starts shooting it in the dark at Branham, not concerned about what might be out there. And it's just handled yeah. in this casual, offhanded way, like there's... Not much, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's harmless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and obviously the misogyny, like the misogyny is real. I don't think that we've encountered real misogyny in this podcast until no. VA. Yeah. Like, I feel like this is something that people should be careful of. Like, I feel like people should not use the word misogyny unless it's really, like, appropriate. Because I think a lot of the time people use it when they just mean, like, oh, it's slightly sexist. Right. right? Like, that's not misogyny. Misogyny is actual hatred of women. Yeah, and this definitely is that. And there is that in this book. Yeah. And it is a really hard thing to get past, even if you're a modern reader who's experienced a little unfortunate experience in life, whatever, and you like you might have certain reasons to feel negatively about certain women, but like you're probably not gonna express it in terms of out and out misogyny. And it is really blatant. Yeah, I mean it almost feels like an incel sci fi novel. Yeah. <laughs> and it really is that far out there. Yeah. So, I mean, I think from this point onward, anybody who's listening will know that when we say something is misogynistic, like, we really mean it. We don't yeah. mean, like, it's slightly sexist, like the original Star Trek or something like that. Like, that's not misogyny. That's just kind of like when we're nice eye candy and sometimes they can work jobs and it's cool. It's maybe an unfortunate attitude, but it's not like. It's not hateful. It's just of its time, maybe. Whereas this is outright from a person who's had maybe not that many experiences, but you'd think that if he had more experiences, he would perhaps be a bit more rounded. But he's had enough experiences where he has become rather misogynistic. And certainly the anecdote described by the translators of how he was like supposed to... I don't know, like he might have even been inclined to marry this person but I yeah don't think i think that was the idea yeah i don't think they spent a lot of time together though no i think he wanted to impress her with his incredible genius and he started reading his poetry and there's a specific name for it it's not like now we'd probably call it an arranged marriage or something but it was like you could actually pay somebody to pair you with some woman i guess i don't like a matchmaking really... type service I yeah guess. like a matchmaking service that that actually sounds like what he did yeah. It's not totally clear, but it sounds like this was meant for like upper class Frenchmen and it was kind of like this marriage scheme, I guess, that he participated in. And it didn't work out because the woman was turned off by him. Yeah, like and really turned off. Yeah. <laughs> Judging by the book, I mean you can kind of see why that might be the case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And maybe that's part of what inspired him to write this. I think it is. They were something like 10 years apart, that incident, maybe longer. I think it yeah. was 73 he had the proposal, and the novel was written in 86. So, so he did end up marrying later in life? Yeah, though I think it was basically on his deathbed just to marry the nurse. I think it was before pregnant. that. Or was it? Yeah, I think, I think it was before that, like by several years. But I think that the idea was like, he might have thought that he was marrying below his station. He definitely thought that, yeah. He, he absolutely thought that. And the woman he was courting that he drove off was somebody with a title and money. And that's what he was really interested in. And that's unfortunate. Like, I think, like, how did he treat that woman? Yeah, I'm sure horribly. Like, granted, his health was on the decline by then, but I, I don't think he was on his deathbed. Like, it, from what I read anyway, like, there was it's at least a couple of years there where he was like married to this woman and he felt like he was above her because he was part of his noble family and entitled to all these things and she was some illiterate peasant woman right basically. yeah exactly yeah doesn't sound too nice no right. <laughs> well i'm kind of interested in oxo yeah like i am it too it's kind of fun maybe yeah i didn't really read too much about it but it seems 
like it's an experimental drama or something along those lines. Yeah, supposedly it very much entertained the people that he was hanging with at the time. And I think it's supposed to be more well-received in the modern era than this work. Yeah, this is definitely a hidden work. Yeah. Not something that's talked about very much nowadays. And I'm glad that we did it. If it really is the source of the word Android, more or less, I think that makes it a really important work. But, I mean, even the way it portrays Haldali, to me, is pretty important. Yeah. Like that, that is pretty ahead of its time. It's certainly far more sophisticated than any other created being we've seen so far, be it a automaton or a biological construct like yeah. in Frankenstein. Yeah, even Frankenstein, like... The creature of uh, Frankenstein is quite well developed. His natural inclinations, based on the way he's been brought up and everything, like it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. But Hadali is more influenced by the society that she was born into. And yeah. in a way, like the whole idea is that she doesn't look different from a human being and she doesn't act differently on the surface anyway her movements are very natural her presentation is everything that a human being's presentation would be so i think that that is that is definitely unique and that is something that we haven't seen before no and it's certainly going to be a very large trope in science fiction going forward from this point absolutely absolutely i don't think we'll see anything quite along Hadali's lines for quite a while yet. No, I don't think so. This is very early for how far it goes into these themes. So would you recommend that people read Tomorrow's Eve? I would say so. With the same yellow flags we've mentioned so far, it can be tough to get through at times, both due to the misogynistic undertones and the pacing of the novel. But overall, I think it is a rewarding experience. I agree. I thought this book was really interesting. The misogyny was difficult, and the fact that half the book was like nothing happening yeah. made it kind of difficult. But in general, it was quite memorable. And I'm going to say right now, Hadali is something that will stick with me for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I think that Hadali as a creation uh, sort of surpassed VA himself. Yeah, I agree. And I think perhaps it went beyond him and was something that perhaps he didn't even realize the implications of fully yep edison's electric spark flowing through. yes <laughs> <laughs> so electricity is mentioned a lot in this book actually yeah yeah this isn't a wind-up toy it's not clockwork it's not gears it's not hydraulics this is edison's electrical system yeah and the way va describes electricity often is like this untamed force almost that has to be like tamed somehow yeah. He makes it seem like a living thing, which is kind of interesting. I don't know that we've seen that before. Perhaps it does reflect VA's, not anti-scientific, but his kind of like attitude that this is something beyond human comprehension. And then... Yeah. The mathematics of electricity around this time, while they were sketched out pretty well, I would say, at least for the this kind of technology that Edison was involved with, it's yeah. still rather advanced calculus that would probably be beyond somebody like VA's comprehension if he didn't and have VA some kind of And VA does talk about background. the differential calculus. Like, he does actually refer very specifically to the mathematics involved. Yeah. But it doesn't appear that he understands it, which no. is fine, because yeah. I wouldn't either. <laughs> but it seems like he's aware of all these things. Right. But electricity is still something to him that is somewhat beyond comprehension it is like a living thing that is hard to tame and the way he describes like all these sparks of flying around everywhere like yeah. he almost makes it seem like they're living beings and he does tie electricity with a lot of life saying that brunettes have natural electricity yeah that's yeah. i think the most quoted line from the novel oh yeah yeah like and even the way he describes when he does something like activate the intercom like there's this electrical spark yeah and it's like this this is almost like a horse that's difficult to tame right like right. It's, it's weird <laughs> the way he describes it it's almost a untamable thing that's a little bit beyond our understanding that we're just starting to understand which makes sense because that's what the truth of things yeah, pretty much yeah which again makes me think maybe his understanding of science was not as basic and inappropriate as or not inappropriate but like 
I guess sketchy and not quite right as what uh, what was supposed. Like it seems like he did think about this stuff a lot. Yeah, and Edison's power station was only in 1882, so mass electrification of objects and everything is still going to be a ways off from when VA right. was writing this in 86. So even even that of this whole underground laboratory living area for Hadali accessible by secret panels in the walls and elevators and stuff like that. Yeah, and wires running everywhere. Yeah. Conducting electrical current and right. conducting different things to different parts of the the establishment. Yeah. So even that is very new. It's fascinating, really. Yeah, it is. Uh, this Frenchman, far removed from what was going on in Menlo Park <laughs> and in New York, Probably never traveled that much. I mean, nothing written about that. And yeah. Like, no reason to suppose that he ever left else. There were a couple technology expositions. The Actually, Gaspar mentioned them. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. But there were similar ones in the 1880s where electrical technologies were displayed. And I don't know if VA ever saw one of these, but it's certainly possible he saw the huge dynamos and things like that that they would have brought along to these uh, exhibitions. He, he must have done. He must have done. Yeah. Because he was obviously inspired, whether he would like to admit it or not. Yeah. It clearly was a thing. And certainly a lot of the big French theaters and large venues could have had electric lighting at that time, though I'm not sure when the first French installation was for power. Maybe, maybe a little further on, but yeah, certainly around that time would have started to have been integrated in. So that's the novel that we did this time. And it's quite an uh, interesting work. Yeah, I would say so. I don't think that we'll be hearing from VA again. No. But I'm glad that we covered this work. Like I said, it was difficult for me to get through. It took the longest. It was really, at times, you know, I just didn't necessarily want to continue with it. But in the end, I'm glad that I did. And I would I would recommend this book, actually. I would recommend that people read it to get an understanding of some early depictions of certain concepts that we still see to the present day. Yeah. So that is pretty much, I think, wrapping up our episode on Automata. Yeah, we'll be covering other mechanized and robotic themes down the line, but this episode we really wanted to focus on the early developments of the tropes yes next month when we return we will be talking about a topic that is dear to the hearts of many and that again like many of the things that we're covering in this podcast doesn't want to die and just continues on into the present day under various permutations that is the topic of the hollow earth most interesting idea that beneath the surface of this earth exists entire other realms, caverns, and tunnels, and multiform honeycombs containing anything from lost human civilizations to entire other civilizations to perhaps other forms of life that we thought were extinct, like ancient reptiles. And there might, in fact, be beneath this earth entirely open vistas that are not known to contemporary science. And we will be actually spending a lot of time on the Hollow Earth because it is such a long-standing branch of the genre, and there are so many different explorations of it. So we actually plan to do two episodes on this topic. So the first episode is one that we're going to be delivering in a month's time. And during this, we will be covering various works, including Simsonia, whose authorship is unknown, but we will certainly be getting into that in the future because there's, there's definitely some interesting things around who might have actually written this work. Yeah. We'll also be getting into Edward Bulwer-Lytton's The Coming Race, also known as Vrilia, and that is a highly influential work written in the early 1870s about uh, underworld exploration. 
And there's a few other ones that we'll be covering that first episode. Yep, we're going to be looking at a very early one written by Ludwig Holberg from 1741 called Niels Klim's Underground Travels. And that's one of those ones written by a Danish author, but he wrote it in Latin so more people could understand what he was talking about. That should be good. That's yeah. mentioned by a lot of future authors, I think, including Poe. Yeah. Who obviously read that work. Yeah. But in the second part, we're going to be dealing with two works that are still quite popular today. Yes. Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth and... Edgar Rice Burroughs at the Earth's Core. Yes, at the Earth's Core. So we will be journeying into the 20th century. So we haven't done that much yet. So I hope that 20th century fans are happy. <laughs> are finally uh, getting into the 20th century. We will be... 1914, so not too, too far in. But, no, uh... not too far, but... So far, the only other 20th century work we've done is First Man in the Moon, which is 1901, right. which is, you know, pretty much not the 20th century. Yeah, but yep. the born very, very cusp of. So we'll definitely be doing more, you know, more of that stuff yeah. as we go on. We're not averse. We just happen to be delving in a lot of the older works right now because it's pretty interesting and it's something that's not covered by that many purveyors. Like, we don't see that very often. People spend a lot of time on uh, Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke and even the early 20th century sci-fi purveyors. Like, it, it seems to start around the 1930s Yeah, for most people. But I think we're so, finding that there's a lot of fascinating stuff from the 19th century and really... Oh, yeah. yeah. Development of pretty much almost all the modern sci-fi tropes. So we're going to be spending a fair amount of time there, but I think in future episodes we're going to be dipping our toes more into the 20th century as we yeah, go on. and I'm looking forward to that because that's kind of my, like, science fiction background. Yep, but we've been kind of going in a somewhat chronological order, not necessarily, but yeah, slowly not too moving... Yeah, but... Slowly we, moving our way through time as we go. Right, right. So I uh, expect to see more 20th century works as we go on. Yep, but this Hollow Earth episode is going to be quite a thick crust for us to drill through but i think we're going to yes. eventually get down to the center sphere beware beware number two output pipe so we hope you can join us next time in the meantime you can follow us on facebook at chrononauts podcast twitter at chrononauts sf and check out some additional text at chrononauts podcast.blogspot.com yes all right good night everyone and make sure that you remember who's real and who's automatonic because in the coming days, it may come to matter as the world becomes inundated with artificial people. Good night. Good night. Mm -hmm.